ja'aluka salamatan fid din wa afiyatan fil jasad wa ziyadatan fil ilmi wa barakatan fil rizqi wa tawbatan qabla al maut wa rahmatan inda al maut wa maghfiratan ba'da al maut Allahumma hawwi alaina fi sakarati al maut wa najata min al nar wa al afwa inda al hisab Rabbana la tuzi' qulubana ba'da iz hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahmah Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanah wa fil akhirati hasanah wa kina azab al nar wa kina azab al nar wa kina azab al nar subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wassalamun ala al mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh The Excellency and Distinguished Guests, ladies and gentlemen. Now, let us in. Now, without further ado, we will invite the Chairman of HiCAFS 2021, Professor Sadiman, to deliver the introductory remarks. Acara selanjutnya, penyampaian laporan Ketua Panitia oleh Bapak Profesor Sadiman kepada Bapak kami undang dengan hormat. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. His Excellency Dr. Haji Syahrul Yassin Limpo, Minister of Agriculture of the Republic of Indonesia, Honorable Dr. Fajri Jufri, Director of Indonesian Agency for Agricultural Research and Development, Ministry of Agriculture, Honorable Professor Muhammad Zamrun, Rector of Universitas Halu Oleo, Honorable Dr. Safaruddin, Director of Indonesian Center for Estate Crops Research and Development, Ministry of Agriculture. Honorable Professor Marsuki Iswandi, Dean, Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Halu Oleo. Honorable Speakers, Professor Irwandi Jaswir, International Institute for Halal Research and Training, International Islamic University, Malaysia. Professor Christian Joseph R. Kumagun, Birgham Young University, Idaho. USA, United States of America, Professor Keitaro Tawaraya from Faculty of Agriculture, Yamagata University, Japan, Miss Katie Ricketts from Cicero Agriculture and Food, Australia, and Dr. Chifumi Takagi from National Chongqing University, Taiwan. Distinguished guests, speakers, moderators, presenters, participants, friends and colleges, and students. Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning and may peace and health be upon us all. First of all, let's extend our praise and gratitude to the Almighty God who has given us blessing and mercy so that we can meet and gather today virtually in Zoom platform to attend the second Halu Ole International Conference on Agriculture and Food Security, HICAFS. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you all to the today's virtual meeting of the second HICAFS. This conference is a continuation of previous conference HICAF 1, which was held in 2019, two years ago. This time, the conference is conducted virtually because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The main theme of the second HICAF is sustainable agriculture and food security post-COVID-19 pandemic challenges and new opportunities. 
this conference is appropriate venue for presenting research and study results in the field of agriculture and food security in the light of COVID-19 pandemic. The conference also can serve as a means of communication to foster communication among scientists, scholars, researchers, policy makers, students, and those who are interested in the field of agriculture and food security issues. The conference features eight sub teams, namely crop production and environment, agriculture and rural development, integrated pest and disease management, food sources and diversification, food safety and security, biodiversity and climate change, agribusiness and socioeconomic development, and agricultural waste processing and management. The main teams and sub teams will be discussed through the lecture and presentation of the keynote speakers, invited speakers, and authors. This year, this conference has received 75 abstracts. Most of them will be reviewed and published in AIP proceedings, Scopus Index, Universal Journal of Agricultural Research, and several nationally accredited journals. In this online conference, the presenters, moderators, and participants include academics, researchers, professional, and students from various universities and research institutes. Our honorable speakers come from United States of America, Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, Australia, and Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, in conducting the second hiccups, Faculty of Agriculture collaborates with several associations, namely Indonesian Society of Agricultural Economics, Indonesian Phytopathological Society, Indonesian Society of Agricultural Engineering, Indonesian Society of Agronomy, Indonesian Society of Soil Science, and Indonesian Association of Food Technologies. We also receive some support from PT Telkom Cell. I would like to express my gratitude to these associations and state-owned company for their partnership and support to this conference. As a, chair, as a chairperson of the committee, I would like to thank all the authors who submit their papers to HICAPS 2021 and to reviewers and all committee members who have already worked hard and spent their time preparing and running this event. Finally, we wish you a very warm welcome and hope that you will have a very productive and enjoyable time with this HICAF conference today. That is my program report. Again, thank you very much for your intention participation. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to the chairman of HICAF 2021. Now, we're going to have a welcome speech from the Dean of Agriculture Faculty, Halu Oleo University, Professor Marzuki Iswandi. Selanjutnya, kita akan mendengarkan sambutan yang akan disampaikan oleh Dekan Fakultas Pertanian Universitas Halu Oleo. Kepada Bapak Profesor Marzuki Iswandi, kami persilakan dengan hormat. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. The Excellency Minister of Agriculture of the Republic of Indonesia, Dr. Sahrul Yassin Limpo. The Excellency Rector of Universitas Halolio, Professor Muhammad Zamrun F. As well as a keynote speaker at this seminar. The Honorable Director of Indonesian Center for Estate Crops Research and Development, Dr. Safaruddin as a keynote speaker. The Honorable invited speakers and distinguished presenters and all participants. This conference, 
Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Praise and gratitude. We pray to the present for Allah, the Almighty God, for His mercy and affection. We are still given health and the opportunity and the opportunity to attend this conference event. Truth is must be held online because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The second Halulio International Conference on Agriculture and Food Security, HICAF 2021, is a continuation of the first HICAF held in 2019. This conference also part of the commercialization commercial series of the 40th anniversary of Unitas Halolio and the 40th anniversary of the agriculture faculty because agriculture faculty was one of the first four faculty of Universitas Halolio. We want to thank the rector of Universitas Halolio for supporting this international conference. This conference is held on discuss recent issues in agriculture and food security. Hopefully, we can all contribute to the development of agriculture and food security throughout this conference. This conference also expected to increase the number of scientific publications, especially from the Universitas Hololeo faculty members. Khususnya untuk Sivitas Akademika Universitas Halolio. As the Dean of Agriculture Faculty Universitas Halolio, I kindly welcome keynote speakers, invited speakers, presenters, and participants at the second Halolio International Conference on Agriculture and Food Security, HICAF 2021. I hope this seminar will run smoothly until the end. Furthermore, we respectfully request the willingness of the Rector of Universitas Halolio to open this conference and deliver the material as keynote speaker. Finally, I would like to thank the committee who have, pre who have prepared and organized this conference. Thank you. Wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Thank you very much to Professor Marzuki Iswandi for the expansive remarks. The Excellency and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now we are going to invite the Rector of Halu Oleo University to officially open our international conference and to deliver the first keynote speech. Please welcome Professor. Muhammad Zamrun. Acara selanjutnya, penyampaian sambutan dan sekaligus pembukaan resmi seminar internasional oleh Bapak Profesor Muhammad Zamrun kepada Bapak kami undang dengan hormat. Thank you, thank you very much. Terima kasih and very good morning for all of us. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Suara saya kedengaran ya. Can everybody hear my voice? Is it okay? Oke, okay, oke. Okay. Oke, okay, thank you very much. Oke, okay, thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma ba'd. <coughs> uh, Excellencies. Minister of Agriculture the Republic of Indonesia, Mr. Dr. Uh, Sahrul Yassin Limpo, and also as an uh, keynote speaker in this conference. Excellencies, uh, invited speaker. And ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to all of us. 
Alhamdulillah, I will mix my speech uh, in Indonesia as well in English. Uh, because I know the participants, uh, 80% or maybe 70% or 80% from uh, Indonesia. Puji syukur selalu kita panjatkan kehadirat Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, Tuhan Yang Maha Esa, atas berkat rahmat dan karunia-Nya kepada kita semua, sehingga pada hari ini kita masih bersama-sama ada di sini, uh, walaupun in the pandemic COVID-19 situation with almost two years from the starting of this pandemic on March uh, 2020. Mudah-mudahan uh, kita selalu dalam keadaan sehat, tegar, ya dan selalu mematuhi protokol kesehatan, uh, at least use masker, and also uh, get vaccinated. Salawat dan salam tentu saja mari kita selalu curahkan kepada seluruh rasul-rasul utusan Allah terkhusus kita yang muslim kepada Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, keluarganya, sahabat-sahabatnya dan para pengikutnya. Terkhusus kita yang sempat hadir pada hari ini ya semoga karoma dari Rasulullah selalu dapat kita tiru dan kita jalankan di dalam uh, kehidupan kita sehari-hari di dalam menjalankan tugas dan tanggung jawab kita sesuai dengan amanah yang diberikan kepada kita semuanya. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, of course, uh, <coughs> even in the pandemic situation, but we, uh, Hallelujah University, try to <coughs> do our function is uh, academic institution to do the Of course, the uh, uh, three main duty of the university that is the in education, research, and community service. And this uh, conference is one uh, of the <coughs> duty that is for uh, in this uh, research. In this conference, of course, is the continuing from the first uh, high cap 2019 at the time. Uh, we meet all together in the one room and then we can communicate directly. Unfortunately, this year, because of the pandemic COVID-19, uh, we do the seminar by using the Zoom platform. Of course, I do hope even in the using the Zoom platform, we meet, uh, <clears throat> it's not directly meeting, but I hope we can discuss uh, many issues about the uh, agriculture especially in indonesia and more especially in uh, southeast sulawesi in our uh, province tentu saja memang banyak hal yang harus kita lakukan tentu saja walaupun di masa pandemi covid tapi mudah-mudahan semuanya bisa berjalan dengan lancar i do appreciate to the uh, organizing committee from the faculty of agriculture halulu university In these years, Hallelujah University celebrate the 40th uh, years uh, anniversary, as well as the 40 years of the Faculty of Agriculture, because in the born of Hallelujah University consists of four faculty, that is Faculty of Agriculture, Faculty of Economic, Faculty of uh, Political Science, and Faculty of uh, Educational Training. Faculty of Education. So this is the main uh, four main faculty of Hallelujah University in the beginning of uh, 1981. Mudah-mudahan, uh, but this year, the, from the beginning uh, consists of uh, four faculties. Now, uh, Hallelujah University have uh, 15 faculties and two programs, vocational program and uh, postgraduate program. Uh, tentu saja memang uh, kita berusaha sebaik mungkin untuk bisa uh, melaksanakan, memberikan layanan karena kita sebagai uh, academic institution itu lebih banyak memang main core kita itu adalah uh, memberikan layanan kepada stakeholder terutama mahasiswa kita. Nah, saya sangat mengapresiasi sekali kerja-kerja dari 
bukan cuma dari Fakultas Pertanian saja, tetapi seluruh sivitas akademika Universitas Aloleo yang sudah berkontribusi terhadap uh, kemajuan Universitas Aloleo sampai dengan hari ini. Saya tidak ingin berpanjang lebar, but uh, I do hope this conference will be useful for all of us, and then the discussion and the communication is not only through this conference, but after this conference we can communicate uh, each other sharing idea, sharing uh, knowledge about the agriculture, and then we can continue to communicate to make the uh, collaboration between uh, academic uh, lecturer from Halolio University and many lecturers from all around Indonesia and of course from all around the world. Because you know that now the war is borderless, so we can communicate in, in any time. Uh, jadi mudah-mudahan kolaborasi ini bisa tetap lanjut sehingga nanti uh, bisa melaksanakan penelitian bersama, publikasi bersama, diskusi tentang apa saja. And I do hope, of course, uh, many, I mean, uh, lecturer from Halolio University can do the joint publication, research together, and anything that we can, uh, that will be useful for the agriculture in Indonesia and also in an other uh, country. By saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, HICAP 2021 uh, is uh, open. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So I will uh, <clears throat> give the a short, uh, it's not only because uh, my, my major is uh, actually is not uh, agriculture. Even I have uh, the student of uh, Faculty of Agriculture of Aloe University was only for one year. Yeah. Walaupun saya, uh, my major now is physics. Yeah, but at the time, uh, to, uh, 1991, uh, I was the student of Halolio, uh, Faculty of Agriculture of Aloe University, the study program of agronomy. Jadi, walaupun uh, major saya sekarang itu bukan, apa, bukan pertanian, tapi saya pernah menjadi mahasiswa pertanian Universitas Salolio angkatan tahun 1991 program studi agronomi. Jadi selama dua semester saya sempat kuliah ya paling jauh sampai apa dasar-dasar agronomi waktu itu. Oke, okay, but uh, in this uh, talk I will try to just a brief uh, summary of what we can do or what uh, Halolio do, Halolio University do for the agriculture. Uh, sesuai dengan tema pada hari ini itu adalah uh, sesuai dengan temanya itu adalah uh, sustainable agriculture and food uh, security post covid 19 pandemic challenges and new opportunities jadi uh, bagaimana uh, pertanian berkelanjutan dan ketahanan pangan uh, di masa pandemi COVID, uh, bagaimana tantangannya dan peluang-peluang apa saja yang bisa kita kerjakan. Mudah-mudahan saya bisa share screen ya, saya coba. Uh, bisa ya Pak ya? Bisa, bisa Oke, oke, okay, okay. thank you very much. So, so what I will talk today is the what the University University roles in promoting the sustainable agriculture. Jadi saya lebih banyak nanti uh, berbicara uh, kebijakan saja apa yang sudah pernah apa yang sudah dikerjakan dan yang akan dikerjakan oleh Universitas Aloleo khususnya dosen-dosen. Uh, yang ada di Fakultas Pertanian. Nah, uh, saya nanti uh, uh, saya akan bicara tentang tiga hal. Pertama, uh, uh, a brief history of uh, about Halolio University, and then the current agricultural challenges and the role of Halolio University in promoting the sustainable agriculture. Jadi Uh, secara garis umum saja lah saya akan bicara tentang ya bagaimana Universitas Aloleo, kemudian masalah apa saja yang kita hadapi dan kira-kira apa kontribusi Universitas Aloleo 
dalam rangka <coughs> pengembangan uh, pertanian yang berkelanjutan. Nah, uh, Halulio uh, ini apa Halulio University as I mentioned before that this year is the 40th uh, anniversary of Halulio University. Halulio University established uh, on the decree it's on August 14 uh, 1981. But uh, officially the pledge is uh, signed by the Directorate General of Higher Education on August 19, uh, 1981. Jadi di tanda tangan itu tanggal 19 Agustus, that's why the August 19 as the anniversary of Halulio University. As the 34th uh, national university in Indonesia. Jadi didirikan di Kendari pada tahun 1981 sebagai Universitas Negeri yang ke-34 kalau saya tidak salah. Nah, itu lokasinya di situ. Jadi kalau dari Jakarta, from Jakarta to Kendari by direct flight, it's around about uh, two and a half uh, hours. Kalau penerbangan langsung itu ya dua jam setengah. Ya kalau misalnya transit di Makassar, ya sekitar 4-5 jam lah baru nyampe di Kendari. Nah, Uh, tentu saja uh, seperti saya katakan uh, as I mentioned before that in the beginning the Halu University consists only uh, four faculties but now uh, the uni Halu University have 15 faculties two program that is the vocational program and the postgraduate program which have the 111 study program starting from vocational, uh, vocational uh, undergraduate, and postgraduate. Jadi tentu saja memang uh, sesuatu yang ya lumayan besar lah. Mulai awal berdirinya cuma empat fakultas, sampai dengan sekarang menjadi 15 fakultas, ditambah dengan uh, program pasca sarjana dan program pendidikan vokasi. Yang waktu itu uh, cuma sekitar, ya nggak sampai 10 program studi kalau saya nggak salah, sekarang itu sudah menjadi 111 program studi. Uh, now the student body of Halu University is around, uh, mungkin agak salah ini, sekitar 40 ribu, ya, yeah, uh, 40,000 uh, students with a lecture. Uh, ini juga kurangan. Ini yang yang pegawai negeri aja, ditambah dengan yang non PNS itu sekitar hampir 2 ribu. Jadi uh, the lecturer of Halu University is almost uh, 2,000 lecturers. Nah, tentu saja uh, yang berkaitan dengan apa? Uh, food and Agriculture itu ada empat atau lima fakultas ya, yaitu Faculty of Agriculture, Faculty of Animal Husbandry, Faculty of Forestry and Environmental Sciences, and Faculties of Fisheries and Marine Science. All these faculties, and all the three faculties, Faculties of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry, and Forestry and Environmental Sciences, uh, formally is the part of the Faculty of Agriculture. Jadi mereka tiga fakultas ini itu lahir dari uh, Fakultas uh, Pertanian. Uh, tentu saja uh, uh, banyak hal yang harus kita kerjakan. Universitas Haloleo tidak bisa berdiri sendiri. We have to work together with uh, other university from all around the world, not only from uh, Indonesia but also from the universities from uh, other countries. Jadi kita punya kerjasama dengan Eropa, Amerika, Kanada, Australia, Asia, ya. Uh, kemudian Afrika juga. Jadi kita coba untuk bekerja sama dengan seluruh perguruan tinggi yang kira-kira bisa mempunyai visi yang sama untuk memajukan pendidikan di dunia ini tentu saja. Jadi kita punya kerjasama baik di dalam negeri maupun di luar negeri. Nah, Tentu saja uh, banyak banyak masalah ya artinya kita mulai dari apa artinya uh, sebelum pandemik before the pandemic uh, COVID-19 kita masuk di uh, era revolusi industri 4.0 di mana ya apa dengan perubahan yang sangat tepat kita harus menyesuaikan dengan apa perkembangan ilmu dan teknologi dan lain sebagainya jadi ya masalah utamanya memang Uh, setelah COVID itu biasanya kan kalau dulu kita cuma bicara the problems just only climate change, kemudian food insecurity, depletion, depletion and natural resources and food 
was. Tapi setelah COVID-19 ya mau tidak mau semua yang empat tadi itu itu juga ikut terpengaruh. Nah di samping itu kemudian di level nasional ya tentu saja banyak banyak hal juga. We have uh, any agricultural issues in Indonesia, for example uh, food and nutrition insecurity, competitiveness of agriculture products, start, uh, products, status and size of land and ownership, education and age of uh, farmers. Rural poverty, destruction of industry 4.0, and climate change hampir sama dengan apa uh, almost the same with the global agricultural issues, tapi disesuaikan nanti uh, according to the local issues in Indonesia. Nah, di level apa regional, especially in South Sulawesi, tentu saja kita pasti akan we have many problem, we have many issues that we have to solve together. Jadi banyak hal yang harus kita kerjakan. Ya, di samping masalah nasional tadi juga disesuaikan dengan uh, keadaan lokal yang ada di Sulawesi Tenggara. Seperti, as we know, the South East Sulawesi itu uh, almost uh, hampir semua pekerjaannya itu ya petani dan nelayan gitu. Karena ya daerah kita, apalagi saya selalu mengatakan seperti 4% of the area of uh, South East Sulawesi is water. Jadi 74 persen itu air, kemudian sisanya ya petani tambak, ditambah dengan sekarang we have the mining. Nah, jadi itu semua nanti yang menjadi uh, masalah yang ada di Sulawesi Tenggara. Nah, saya mungkin artinya banyak ini ini apa just only uh, I think uh, many of us uh, now about this uh, issue between seven uh, and eight. 111 million people in the world went hungry in 2020. Jadi ini yang artinya kalau orang pertanian pasti tahu semuanya ini. Jadi ya banyaklah uh, banyak orang yang lapar di, apa, di, di tahun 2020 dan ini menjadi masalah dunia bukan cuma di Indonesia saja. Nah, <tuh> jadi kadang-kadang memang uh, apa yang menjadi sebenarnya kan. Uh, kalau bicara lebih anu nanti ya apa ya ketahanan pangan lebih lebih ke situ nanti. Jadi kalau kita sudah punya ketahanan pangan berarti ke belakangnya kan mulai petani, infrastruktur dan lain sebagainya harus kita kita apa kerjakan dengan bagus dan ini sudah dikerjakan oleh beberapa dosen. Ini I think many of the lecturer of from Faculty of Agriculture they have uh, research uh, concerning this topic. Jadi sudah banyak hal yang mereka they have, they have already done many things about this uh, subject. Nah, saya tidak akan lepas dari sini. Artinya kalau ini kan uh, apa ya rantainya orang Sulawesi, apa, apa rantainya orang pertanian pasti sudah tahu. Jadi bagaimana diproduksi, kemudian bagaimana diproduk apa dikemas dengan bagus dan lain sebagainya sampai dengan di konsumen, tetapi karena ya kadang-kadang pendistribusiannya bagaimana nah, itu menjadi masalah besar buat kita semua dan itu yang dipikirkan nanti sehingga jadi masalah pertanian ini bukan kadang-kadang kalau kita bahas secara umum, it's not only the uh, doing uh, that's not, it's not only have to do, have to be done by the agriculture, I mean the person in uh, uh, concern in agriculture, but all We have to. The responsibility is not only the people in agriculture, but also in other uh, other people from uh, other subject. Jadi bukan cuma orang pertanian aja. Nanti banyak teman-teman yang harus turut uh, bersama-sama agar uh, ini semua bisa terlaksana dengan baik. Nah, kalau ini kan masalah umum. Uh, climate change ini, uh, this is, uh, I mean, this the global global problem. Uh, I mean. Sudah menjadi masalah umum di dunia tentang climate change. Selalu yang tidak bahas ya climate change, climate change. Kalau orang pertanian pasti selalu bilang itu. Dan saya kira ini ya perubah apa? Karena pertanian kan sangat tergantung dengan cuaca. Gitu. Jadi memang uh, harus di apa dipikirkan dengan baik sekali. Nah kemudian, sorry. nah ini apa? Uh, tetapi juga banyak hal yang artinya. Uh, karena apa? Karena apa? Climate change itu sangat berpengaruh terhadap uh, 
pertanian tentu saja, bukan artinya pertanian dalam arti luas, bukan pertanian cuma untuk nanam, tapi pertanian dalam arti luas itu sangat uh, mendera berbagai negara, bukan cuma Indonesia, tapi saya pikir uh, hampir semua negara di dunia. Nah, nah apa yang harus apa di apa di Indonesia kadang-kadang kita dihadapkan itu apa ya terlalu banyak petani yang lahannya sedikit gitu, ya ya paling ya rata-rata itu di bawah 0,3 hektar, 0,3 hektar itu berarti sekitar berapa ya? 300 meter persegi kalau nggak salah itu. Ya, jadi artinya masalah kita itu terlalu banyak petani yang lahannya terlalu sedikit gitu. Kemudian yang kedua teknologinya yang belum bagus. Ya, jadi ini ya menjadi tanggung jawab menjadi isu yang harus diselesaikan oleh para apa uh, ya peneliti khususnya kita di Sulawesi Tenggara jadi kita bertanggung jawab semua sehingga bagaimana menyelesaikan ini adalah menjadi tanggung jawab kita semua kemudian uh, kadang-kadang terlalu banyak penggunaan uh, pupuk ya pupuk pupuk khususnya yang bukan bukan pupuk alami tapi pupuk buatan yang kita tahu semua itu ya sangat tidak apa sebenarnya ya sangat tidak dianjurkan saya kira orang pertanian saya cuma menyebutkan aja saya lebih jangan kemudian kadang-kadang ya karena terlalu over produk nah, biasanya kita tidak bisa uh, men- apa, menyimpan gitu sehingga nanti terbuang dengan percuma jadi ini yang menjadi tantangan tersendiri juga buat para petani untuk apa ketahanan pangan untuk para peneliti dan dan sebagainya terlalu over produk jadi kebanyakan produk tetapi kita tidak bisa kelola dengan baik Nah, di samping itu juga ya kadang-kadang eh, menjadi masalah kita di Indonesia sekarang banyak orang yang tidak mau jadi petani. Eh, I mean most people in Indonesia they don't want to be a farmer. Jadi itu kan juga problem gitu. Sehingga usia petani sekarang itu ya sudah 40 tahun ke atas. So majority of Indonesian farmer itu ya it's over a uh, 40. Jadi lebih dari 40 tahun. Dan ini kan juga masalah. Kalau misalnya yang 40 tahun ini, 10 tahun, 15 tahun ke depan kan 50. Sementara tidak ada yang mau jadi petani kan juga masalah. Gitu. Ya makanya sekarang kita mencoba agar uh, mereka tertarik dengan pertanian. Nah kembali ke Sulawesi Tenggara tentu saja uh, isunya sih hampir sama. Jadi ini apa Provinsi Sulawesi Tenggara uh, in South East of Sula- uh, South Sulawesi Province uh, consist of uh, 70 regency, jadi 17 kabupaten kota yang ada di Sulawesi Tenggara juga mengalami masalah yang sama. Jadi hampir sama masalahnya. Jadi misalnya, yaitu tadi petani dengan lahan yang sempit, kemudian bagaimana petani itu bisa apa ya ber, apa bergening dengan apa dengan masyarakat sekitar kemudian konversi apa konversi lahannya kemudian produk apa eh, hasil yang sangat sedikit dan kadang-kadang kualitasnya tidak bagus dan yang kemudian eh, di samping itu karena kita tahu juga ya education mereka itu kan ya rata-rata paling ya SMA lah sehingga ya dari segi manajerialnya kurang bagus dan juga skillnya kurang bagus dan yang terakhir tentu saja seperti hampir di masalah apa masalah nasional itu adalah bagaimana uh, mengelola produksi yang terlalu banyak sehingga tidak menjadi rusak nantinya nah mudah-mudahan dengan ini dengan masalah-masalah we have uh, many problem in South East Sulawesi as, as well in Indonesia of course this is the challenges for us the challenges for the researcher from uh, <coughs> agriculture uh, they can solve this uh, problem. Jadi saya kira and I, I think the in this conference they will talk they will discuss uh, about this problem how to solve this. Nah tentu saja ya sehingga ya as a consequence ya tentu saja ya income-nya pasti sangat rendah. So the income of a uh, farmer is very very low. Jadi kalau misalnya apa inkannya sedikit kan ya berarti apa tidak terlalu banyak, bagus lah dari segi ekonomi itu juga tantangan. Nah 
uh, saya ini lewat saja. Nah, Hallelujah University tentu saja apa yang kita kerjakan itu seperti saya katakan di depan tadi, we have three main dari education, research, and uh, outreach, uh, especially for the community service. Jadi what we have done is many many what we have done education for creating future farmer for example the technological literacy managerial skill entrepreneurial skill science in agriculture we have to uh, kita coba untuk memberikan ini kepada mahasiswa dan kalau misalnya sudah ke mahasiswa nanti kita artinya membuat pendidikan kemudian nanti uh, apa uh, research and development-nya kita coba buat dan terakhir nanti kita coba berikan uh, auto research-nya itu ke community service uh, kita mau deliver Uh, our development technologies to local communities through seminar, workshop, training, and assistance. Jadi kita coba memberikan itu apa yang sudah kita bangun di dalam pendidikan dan juga penelitian kita coba berikan kepada masyarakat untuk meningkatkan uh, pola pertanian mereka. Jadi paling tidak apa yang kita kerjakan adalah ya seperti dibilang ini investment in agriculture are the best weapon against the hunger and poverty, and they have made life better for billion of people. Jadi ya. Ya investasi dalam pertanian itu saya kira memang sudah sangat apa ya sudah sangat misalnya lah, kalau kita tidak makan mati semua kita. Jadi mudah-mudahan uh, seminar pada hari ini I do hope this uh, conference will results uh, many suggestion ya yeah, for the government for the farmer and for the institution and of course for all of us to make the agriculture more better in the future. Saya kira itu saja yang ingin saya sampaikan. Terima kasih. Lebih dan kurangnya mau dimaafkan. Bila itu aktual hidayah. Uh, sebelum saya akhiri, uh, in the pandemi COVID-19, uh, I ask to all of you to always use masker and also get uh, vaccinated. Jadi mudah-mudahan kita semua tetap uh, sehat, tetap menggunakan apa menjalankan protokol kesehatan pakai masker menjaga jarak cuci tangan dan yang terakhir pakai masker sebagai salah satu ikhtiar kita untuk uh, menghindari atau untuk memutus rantai pandemi covid 19 saya kira itu saja yang ingin saya sampaikan terima kasih bilahi taufik wal hidayah assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh waalaikumsalam thank you to profesor muhammad zamrun Excellency and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, in this point in time, I would kindly invite our second keynote speaker by Dr. Shahrul Yasin Limpo as the Indonesian Minister of Agriculture. Selanjutnya, keynote speaker kedua oleh Menteri Pertanian Republik Indonesia, Bapak Dr. Shahrul Yasin Limpo. Kepada Bapak, kami persilakan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera, salam sehat untuk kita semua. Anna wa syukran lillah. Wala hawla wa ala quwwata illa billah. Rabbi shalli sadri wa yassir li amri. Wahdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli jalal yaziran min ahli. Pak Rektor dan segenap uh, sivitas akademika Universitas Haluh Oleo khususnya Fakultas Pertanian, undangan sekalian, hadirin sekalian yang sama saya hormati. Kita bersyukur bisa dipertemukan dalam kehidupan dunia yang baru di era kita, di mana mungkin secara fisik kita tidak bersama-sama saat ini, tapi hati kita saling menjabat, pikiran kita saling bertemu, dan tentu, kita berharap upaya dan tekad kita untuk menemukan masa depan kehidupan yang lebih baik bangsa ini. Masa depan dari Universitas Halu Oleo bersama seluruh mahasiswa Fakultas Pertanian akan menemukan gridnya untuk bisa bicara kepada kepentingan kehidupan yang harus lebih baik hari ini, besok dan masa depan yang ditopon oleh pertanian yang kuat. Oleh karena itu, saya tentu me, uh, mengapresiasi apa yang dilakukan oleh Fakultas Pertanian Halu Oleo terhadap uh, konferensi yang dilakukan hari ini. 
uh, tentang pertanian. Dan Indonesia adalah negara tropis yang menjanjikan segalanya. Bahkan tidak saja itu, Indonesia sebagai negara besar keempat dunia sesudah Cina, Amerika, India, Indonesia, di bawah Indonesia, Pakistan, dan ini Brasil, ini menjadi kekuatan-kekuatan yang sangat besar. Dan pertanian adalah pilihan strategis. Dan dengan demikian saya berharap Halu Oleo International Conference on Agriculture and Food Security ini menemukan rekomendasi-rekomendasi terbaik untuk mengatakan di era COVID bukan hanya medical solution, food security menjadi sangat penting. Kenapa? Ketahanan pangan adalah memperkuat kebutuhan makan 273 juta orang. Pangan yang terakselerasi dengan baik akan menjadi lapangan kerja yang terbuka di depan mata kita. Bahkan pertanian yang terakselerasi memperkuat ekonomi dasar yang ada mulai dari kabupaten, provinsi, bahkan secara nasional dan kehidupan baru dunia melalui digital dan frekuensi dengan tata lead yang tersedia membuat dunia menjadi satu untuk kita sama-sama berkontribusi pada kebaikan dan kesejahteraan dan sekaligus bisa menjadi ruang-ruang intervensi dari kemampuan-kemampuan pertanian kita yang dibutuhkan oleh berbagai negara dari komoditi-komoditi pertanian tropis yang kita miliki. Universitas Aloe Leo haruslah universitas berkelas dunia yang menghadirkan sumber daya manusia unggul yang besok akan banyak berkontribusi pada kehidupan bangsa dan negara. Selamat untuk kita semua. Ridha Allah bersama kita. Sekian. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Saya Menteri Pertanian Republik Indonesia. Selamat. Now, we invite the Dr. Fajri Jufri as the Director of Indonesia Agency for Agriculture and Development for third keynote speech. Selanjutnya, kami undang keynote speaker ketiga oleh Bapak Dr. Fajri Jufri sebagai Direktur Pusat Penelitian dan Pengembangan Tanaman Perkebunan Kementerian Pertanian Republik Indonesia. Profesor Dr. Muhammad Samrun Firuhu, Director of Halulio University, Honorable Guest, Invite Speaker, and all participants, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, good morning, and greeting to all of us. First, I want to thank the presence of Allah Almighty for the abundance of grace and the joy that all of us can still gather in this spiritual conference today without any barrier at all and good health. I would like to say congratulations to Halulio University for organizing this wonderful international conference with the theme Sustainable Agriculture at Food Security Post-COVID-19 Pandemic Challenges and New Opportunities. Mr. Rector, invite speaker, ladies and gentlemen. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic has resolved various social restricting policies in order to reduce spread on the virus. These conditions have an impact on the entire agriculture system, starting from the system of, of production, distribution, processing, as well as consumption or markets. Ladies and gentlemen, during the COVID-19 pandemic, agriculture has proved that the, this sector is the backbone of Indonesian economy. For example, in the first three months of 2021, agriculture contributed 16.24% to the GDP. Also, the agricultural sector is the leading contributor to national export, even the weakening of the world economy due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2020, the export value of agriculture commodity reached 451.55 trillion rupiahs and grew by 
percent compared with 2019, where the plantation subsector contribute to 91 percent of the export. Recently, on 14 August 2021, Mr. President Jokowi released agricultural export product simultaneously from 74 of seaport and airport in 70 provinces with 61 destination countries. The export product released on that occasion among 7.29 trillion rupees. The positive contribution of agricultural sector during the COVID-19 pandemic needs to be maintained will so that it will have significant impact on the national economic recovery and food security as well as improving the welfare of farmers. In fact, speaker and all our participants, ladies and gentlemen, the agriculture development in Indonesia has many issues covering social, economic, and environmental aspects. Even though agriculture expansion is considered one of the main causes of the environmental externalities, such as deforestation, land use change, and greenhouse gas emission, which contribute to the climate change, this agriculture production is also highly affected by the changing in climate pattern. All of those challenges require sustainable approaches in agriculture development. Many studies show that agricultural sector is developed appropriately. It can contribute to better environmental sustainable rather than as contributor to environmental destruction by the application of technological innovation. The technological innovation resulting from the research institutions or universities should be economically feasible, social acceptable, local adaptive, and environmentally sustainable, which also have a high contribution for national food security. Ladies and gentlemen, we believe that our national development can sustain better of to our next generation by managing all for all natural resources. It can also contribute to the world environment. Developing sustainable agriculture needs some invention and innovation regarding research about added value and competitiveness. We hope this event successful and productively support sustainable development goals, SDGs, to strengthen human welfare globally and nationally. Finally, I am very grateful for the participation and active role of the invited speaker from within and outside the countries, as well as the participant who presented the result of the research. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Dr. Fajri Jufri, as Director of Indonesian Agency for Agricultural Research and Development. Now we invite Dr. Sorry. Now we invite Professor Sahta Ginting to be a moderator of Plenary Session One. Selanjutnya, kami undang Bapak Profesor Sahta Ginting untuk menjadi moderator pada sesi Plenary pertama. Kepada Bapak, kami persilakan dengan hormat. Makasih, thank you very much for the organizing King committee. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi dan salam salam sejahtera untuk kita sekalian. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to all participants and audiences, especially for the rector of the Halulewo University and the Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture. Thank you so much to have joined in the second Halulewo International Conference on Agriculture and Food Security. I would like to introduce myself 
My name is Sahta Ginti, professor in soil science in faculty of agriculture of Haluleu University. I'm acting as the moderator to lead the presentation of two invited speakers, namely Professor Christian Joseph R. Kumagun. Welcome to the seminar. Are you there, Professor? Uh, yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you so much to have joined with us. And now in Idaho, about night, yeah, to eight o'clock, yeah, about eight o'clock p.m. Sunday, eh, Monday, mo Monday night. Monday night, correct. And secondly, I would like to warm, warmly welcome to Professor Keitaro Tawaraya. Are you there? Yes, I joined the Zoom. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I will lead the two invited speakers. Firstly, I will give the time to invited speaker, Professor Christian Joseph R. Kumagun. And this is a short his curriculum vitae. Could you please show the on on the screen? It needs a little bit time. And I will read his cur curriculum vitae in my hand. Professor Christian Joseph Arkumagun uh, has the position as the senior Postdoctoral Research Fellow, Department of Entomology, Plant Pathology and Nematology, University of Idaho, USA. And also, he is a Jans Professor at Department of Biology, Brigham Young University, Idaho, United States of America. And also, he is a junk professor at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, UPLB, Institute of Weed Science, Plant Pathology, and Entomology. He has been included in 66 refereed journal articles, one edited book, seven book chapters, and more than 1,300 citations. Professor Christian, uh, I would like to give you time to present your presentation for about 15 to 20 minutes. Now is time for you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, well, Salamat Pagi. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay. well? Okay. Let me just pull up my, my slide here. Uh, I hope you can all see my, my slide. Uh, oh. Okay. Well, um, I've been honored and pleased to uh, present my my paper for the uh, International Conference on Agriculture and Food Security of the uh, Universitas uh, 
I don't know how to pronounce it. Halu al Halalu. And of course, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the invitation of uh, one of your colleagues, Professor Andy Kerouni, whom I met more than 10 years ago uh, in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, in an Asian uh, society for a plant pathology meeting. Um, I am pleased to talk about the topic of mycotoxin contamination of agricultural crops in the Philippines and Indonesia and the database approach to mycotoxin analysis. So, so basically, uh, I've been to Indonesia for, I think, three or four times. So, and as you can see, I'm wearing your batik. <laughs> I love your batik. I, I, I wear it anywhere. I'm associated with uh, these universities. Um, actually, this presentation is an output of my research at the University of Göttingen in Germany when I was a visiting professor from 2017 to 2019. And we had a, a PhD student, an Indonesian PhD student as co-author of this paper, Rian Angriawan, who is affiliated with the, the University of, uh, well, that's the university, Universitas Chandrai Saudi, Saudi Raman. Uh, and also a, a PhD student, uh, uh, Samuel Osman. Um, as you all know, uh, mycotoxins are very important uh, uh, secondary metabolites produced by uh, fungi, namely aspergillus uh, species. This species of fungus produces so-called aflatoxins. And the other uh, secondary metabolite are the fumonisins produced by the fusarium species. They are known to be the most important uh, plant pathogens of global significance because they not only cause diseases in plants, but also they uh, contaminate mostly cereals like rice, corn, wheat, and other crops. They are um, pose, they pose risk to human health because they are carcinogenic. They cause cancer, not only to humans, but also to animals, as well as many other uh, disorders. Uh, the current Philippine uh, situation regarding mycotoxins is virtually is un unexplored, you know. It's a very serious concern in agriculture, but just like any other developing country, it's not a research priority. And what's another issue is that there is no legislation or there's no monitoring limits for these uh, mycotoxins, in particular fumonisins. Um, toxigenity of aspergillus and fusarium species associated with maize are also uh, less known. So we wanted to know the current uh, scenario, which regions of the Philippines are hotspots, meaning the areas that are uh, reported to have high uh, uh, contamination of these mycotoxins. And we would like to know which fungus species are, are involved and also which type of aspergillus are actually the ones that are primary, the primary cause of aplatoxin. Is it the S, meaning the small type morphotype, or is it the L, or the large type uh, aspergillus species? So this is the map of the Philippines, and we, we've uh, collected uh, around over 100 samples from various regions and provinces of the Philippines, showing the difference uh, locations here. The, the smaller the, the circle would mean the smaller the samples and the bigger circles, circles would be the, the bigger the samples. And we plated them in, in culture media and single isolated them. And we tested for the, uh, you know, for the presence of the different species. And we found that aspergillus species 
cons, uh, comprised the large the largest among the species, followed by Fusarium, and some minor uh, mycotoxigenic fungi like Penicillium and Trichoderma were also detected. And we look at you know the 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 two detection methods here, which is kosher plate and DNA or real-time PCR. And we found out that there's a correlation between the two. We could see that quantitative real-time real PCR would be more accurate in terms of uh, detecting positive samples of, of uh, aflatoxin contamination, uh, as well as in the case of detecting fusarium using these two methods, we could say that real-time PCR would be faster, a lot faster and more accurate in detecting uh, the presence of these mycotoxins. Uh, we also look at the, 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 the distribution of aspergillus uh, species, and we found that the L or the large morphotype, which is actually the, the size of their sclerotia bodies, as you can see here, would be around one third of the population. And the rest would be the one like this one, 40% would be non sclerotium producers, meaning they don't produce these kinds of sclerotial bodies. And the rest comprise the other spurgula species. So we also reported new species like Draminarium, which is a very important uh, species of Fusarium that cause or produce. Uh, um, now, this is the uh, pie graph showing the, the, the distribution of uh, fusarium toxins. You can see that pumonisin comprises the largest in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the distribution is about half would be pumonisins, and the, the rest would be like aflatoxin would be would just be 13%. So this is a, just an overview of what we found out that mostly in the southern part of the Philippines, we, we can see the that about 18% of the samples exceeded the limit, which is around 20 microgram per kilogram. Um, and there's also a correlation between these two uh, methods of detection, quantitative PCR and uh, HPLC, or high performance liquid chromatography. In the same uh, manner as the pneumonisins of fusarium toxins, you could also see that there's a high correlation between these two methods. And mostly these fusarium toxins, the namely the pneumonisins are concentrated in the Northern part of the Philippines in Luzon. We, we found that more than 52, more than 50% of the samples exceeded the, the limit, the Fusarium B1 limit or acceptable limit. Um, this slide also shows you the, uh, the sample size distribution of another toxin produced by Fusarium graminar nivalinol, which is a new uh, mycotoxin in the Philippines. And we found that it's somehow found both in the nord northern part and in the southern part. We can see here that HPLC would be more, uh, more sensitive because in qPCR, this has not been detected in the northern part of the Philippines. So this is the first part of my talk. So we just wanted to show that still Aspergillus species, Clavus and Fusarium verticillaris are the predominant species of uh, in Philippine maize. And most of those, these Aspergillus flavus are of the large type or the, they are, don't produce chlorosia. The pneumonisins are more, more prevalent than aflatoxins. It's very e convenient to use quantitative real-time PCR to predict the degree of aflatoxins and pneumonisin contamination compared to the traditional methods like the culture. By, by way of culturing them and identifying them. Northern Philippines are hotspots for aplatoxins and Southern part of the Philippines for pneumonisins. Now the second uh, uh, 
part of my talk, this is probably more interesting for the Indonesian audience because this is basically our study concerning mycotoxin levels in Indonesia as well as in the Philippines from 1971 to 2017. This is about the database approach to mycotoxin occurrence analysis, uh, which is a PhD thesis by uh, Samal Oswan from, um, uh, from uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, so the objectives that we, we tried to, to look at is to develop a framework for web-based mycotoxin statistics. And this involves biological information database on mycotoxin sampling and an output file containing relevant information for scientists. So this database has the following features. It has the data project projection for, you know, for computing statistics related to experiments. And you, one can also generate comparisons of samples based on geographic location, types of materials, and others, as well as correlation or relationship between different species of samples grown in different conditions. So this is the uh, the the overview. So we we actually gathered uh, a huge amount of literature on mycotoxin contamination, specifically on two countries, Philippines and Indonesia, from 1971 to 2017. It's about close to 50 years, the last 50 years. And we know that it's still growing at a faster pace because of the continuing research on these topics. Uh, bringing all this data under one roof, of course, will assist the researcher to have an access to data easily and will help them analyze and compare results one with another. We use this programming language called the MySQL PHP uh, that we that that's PhD student built as a relational data database for mycotoxin. And this, when you use that, will will give you data from the from uh, you know uh, from the uh, this website and will perform statistical analysis. So this is uh, you know the the publications that are that are available from actually from 1940 to 2019 on PubMed. And this is how the website looks like. You can actually just try to visit this website and you will see how that this is a very, you know, still a tentative database, which is uh, a work in progress. You will, you can select, you know, what mycotoxins you are, you want to be interested in and the product, is it from cereals, from corn, rice, limit of detection, limit of quantification, you can select that as well. And what method of extraction? Is it HPLC, ELISA, or, or uh, quantitative PCR? So the present version of the online portal allows the user to define these characteristics, sample types, geographical location, uh, and method of analysis. Um, this is an example of uh, a generated uh, uh, output from that uh, database. So. This shows the geographical location of mycotoxic load in Indonesia and the Philippines based on the, you know, the longitude and latitude uh, as shown on the left side uh, uh, of, the, of, this, of the slide. So the sizes of circle here, I don't know if you can see that, uh, indicates the level of aplatoxin and their position. So the, the bigger, again, the bigger the circles would mean the, the higher the mycotoxins and the smaller the circles would be the lower the mycotoxins. So we can see that all, uh, mo mo most mycotoxin contamination was restricted, was restricted only on the southern parts of Indonesia, as you can see here. This is, I guess, this is um, uh, Java, right? It's Java, right? So, and even in the Philippines, somehow it's almost scattered. So, we can see, we can also uh, conclude that, you know, uh, in this particular case, um, Indonesia is more, uh, more or less, more, more, more contaminated with the aflatoxin, particularly aflatoxin B1, which is the most potent uh, mycotoxin, aflatoxin. 
done in the Philippines. And um, thus, looking at the, 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 the geographical location, we can see maybe this is Sulawesi. So we haven't detected any here because, well, this is based on the, the data that we have gathered from the literature. Uh, we could deduce that it's important to have a targeted uh, regulatory efforts to be prioritized in the southern parts, particularly in Indonesia, to control aflatoxin contamination of crops and food products. So this slide shows you the, uh, the analytical techniques used for aflatoxin determination. So the ones uh, shown in different colors are the different met methods used, ELISA, HPLC, and PLC. You can see that the, most of the methods used in Indonesia on the left, left graph is, um, yeah, is, this is uh, more, or more on PLC, the green one, or thin layer chromatography. Whereas here on the right side, this is actually Philippines. We mostly use HPLC uh, and not much on TLC. Um, we can also say here that, uh, that uh, yeah, ELISA is also predominantly used between 2006 and 2014, whereas TLC and HPLC were, were the preferred methods, yeah, from the 1990s to 2000. But uh, I can also pinpoint here that most of the, the, the food products that were tested in the Philippines were coconuts, coconut, which is a major crop. Not only, of course, not only in the Philippines, but Indonesia. Uh, and there's a greater level of uh, aflatoxin that, are, that is found in uh, coconuts. Whereas in, in Indonesia, most of the uh, aflatoxins were detected in maize. So figure three shows the data from the Philippines, which is collected from 1971 to 2017. And it shows interestingly that aflatoxin contamination of copra mill, which is represented by the blue one, uh, was clustered around from 1992 to 2002. Whereas from 1971, that's only was detected in Mace and then also in year 2017. Um, this figure shows the aflatoxin concentration uh, in Mace samples obtained from Indonesia. And you can see now that the aflatoxin contamination of corn in Indonesia was spread out from 1992 to, to, 19, uh, to 2008 of varying degrees as well. Um, and this one, figure five, it shows the correlation of total uh, aflatoxin content with latitude. You can see here that uh, since geographical location influences, you know, the not only the, well, the climate of the country, we, we found out that um, it's important also to look not only the, 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 I mean the the climate, you know, like temperature, relative humidity, but also the the geographical location here. And you can see Indonesia is represented by the the red circle circles. Philippines are represented by Professor the, Kumagun. Yeah, I'm I'm nearing my my, my two minutes. My yeah, I just have two, two more slides to go. So I just want to conclude that uh, um, aflatoxin, you know, it. Aflatoxin contamination in food products was really dependent more on the uh, the country of origin here. And lastly, this is my last slide actually, the factor on climate, you know, rainfall, it shows here there's, there's a significant difference between uh, the aflatoxin content in maize uh, when you look at the, the, the low uh, rain uh, case versus the high rain, as you can see, significantly different in Indonesia, which is rep which are represented by the red color, and not much on the Philippines. It's basically similar, but if you compare both two countries, you can see significant difference. 
So as a conclusion, uh, we can deduce from our study that the web-based approach aids very much in comparing the effects of temperature, weather, geographical location, and other factors on the spread of mycotoxins in the world. So both countries, well, Indonesia and the Philippines are contaminated with aflatoxins, more on maize in Indonesia and coconut in the Philippines. There's no significant association between aflatoxin contamination and year of sampling. No correlations well on latitude and aflatoxin content in crop commodities in both countries was observed. But the effect of rainfall is very significant. In general, as a, in conclusion, our analysis demonstrates the benefits of a database approach for conducting meta studies of mycotoxin contamination of food in a very conclusive and effective way. I would like to acknowledge the funding from my, my uh, uh, fellowship, the Alexander von Humboldt of, of the Federal Republic of Germany. Terima kasih. Thank you. Maraming salamat. That's Philippine way of saying thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor okay. Kumagun, for your very interesting speech and result of the research. And all the audience and participants, I would like to continue our presentation to the second invited speaker. He is Professor Keitaro Tawaraya. You ready to go, Professor? Yes. Now is your time. More or less 20 minutes. Now time is yours. Can you see my slide show? Yes, already. Thank you. Uh, good morning. It is my pleasure to attend the second uh, Harureo International Conference uh, on Agriculture and Food Security as an invited speaker. I would like to thank the organizing committee and the chairperson, Professor Dr. Saeed Imam. Excuse me, yes, uh, Professor Ketaro. Yes, I apologize. I have to introduce your background shortly. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. Yes. Okay, Professor Ketaro Tawaraya. Uh, now is working at the Faculty of Agriculture, Yamagata University, Japan. Uh, he has 65 Society Awards of Japanese Society of Soil Science and Plant Nutrition in 2020. He is expertise in fertilizers, plant biology, and soil analysis. He has published 148 publication and more than 3,000 citations. Sorry about that. Keep continuing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction. Yes. Wait. Excuse me, Obi.
So today, I would like to talk uh, these three topics, phosphorus resource and the roles of avascular mycorrhizal fungi, reduction of phosphorus fertilizer application with avascular mycorrhizal fungi, and acquisition of unavailable phosphorus by avascular mycorrhizal fungi. So phosphorus fertilizer is made from rock phosphate. Production of rock phosphate will be at the peak around 2030. So this is phosphorus cycling in agricultural system. Phosphate fertilizer uh, produced from phosphate rock and the farmer applied the phosphorus fertilizer to soil and the plant take up phosphorus. However, Phosphorus is not recycled in this system. Insoluble phosphorus and the organic phosphorus cannot be taken up by plant root. So we need to uh, recycle this system. Strategy to, to respond to exhaustion of phosphorus, we need to make strategy to use phosphorus in agriculture and forestry. There are three steps of strategies. First, it is necessary to reduce the P application of phosphorus ap uh, application of phosphorus fertilizer to field soil. Farmers apply excess amount of phosphorus fertilizer because there is no toxicity of phosphorus for plant and the phosphorus fertilizer was not expensive. Next, it is necessary to improve phosphorus use efficiency of plant modern plant breeding program has focused on yield and uh, intensive condition. Finally, phosphorus must be recycled in each country or region. Use of avascular mycorrhizal fungi can reduce phosphorus application. This is a mechanism of phosphorus uptake by avascular mycorrhizal fungi. Avascular mycorrhizal fungi make symbiosis symbiotic association with 80% of land plants. Spores of mycorrhizal fungi in soil germinate, extend, extend uh, extralogical hyphae, and enter into plant roots. And highly branched structure, arbusco, is formed inside the plant cell. Fungi receive sugar from host plant and supply phosphate to plant. Extralogical hyphae further extend into soil far from root surface where phosphorus is depleted. Therefore, colonized plants take up more soil phosphorus than non-colonized non plant. This is growth of onion at three soil phosphorus level with and without inoculation. Red color shows non-inoculated plant, and blue color shows plus AM shows inoculated plant. And P1 is low phosphorus level, P3 is medium, P5 is high phosphorus level. You can see difference of shoot growth between minus AMF and plus AMF. And this difference is higher in low and medium phosphorus level. This is a gross response to avascular mycorrhizal colonization among cultivars. Left side shows mutualistic cultivar, center shows commensalistic cultivar, and the left right side shows parasitic cultivars. Black circle shows inoculated plant, and the white color shows non inoculated plant. So in mutualistic cultivar, a growth of y-axis shows should dry weight of plant. And the black circle is always higher than that of white circle. That means in mutualistic cultivar, a mycorrhizal colonization increased plant growth. On the other hand, parasitic cultivar in low phosphorus level, inoculated plants showed higher growth than non-inoculated, but medium and high phosphorus level, control plant had higher than inoculated plant. So this means mycorrhizal fungi uh, worked parasitic for host plant in parasitic cultivars. 
root trait determined relationship. There was a negative correlation between root lengths of plant and mycorrhizal dependency. Mycorrhizal dependency is growth improvement by colonization. So this figure shows plant with smaller root lengths, highly dependent on mycorrhizal colonization. Next, I would like, I would like to show reduction of phosphorus fertilizer application with a vascular mycorrhizal fungi. Response of a plant to mycorrhizal colonization is different among plant species or cultivars. Onion, Welsh onion, garlic, and asparagus are members of genus Arium. Root system of Arium plants is smaller than other species. Therefore, heavy application of phosphorus fertilizer is necessary for growth of Arium plants. This is weight of onion. Weight of onion means, uh, uh, this is root weight of onion. So onion root system is smaller than other plant, cabbage, cauliflower, lettuce. So heavy application of pea fertilizer is necessary for uh, onion. We carried out field experiment uh, with commercial inoculum. We used arium fistulosum, and uh, there are two treatment control and uh, Gromus R10. Gromus R10 is name of a vascular micro, uh, mycorrhizal fungi commercially available in Japan. And there were soil, phos, soil phosphorus level 300, 600, 1000, 1500 mg PTO5 per kilogram. And the growth period was 189 days. Left side shows commercial mycorrhizal fungal inoculum in Japan. Center is paper pot system. So we use this paper pot seedling system to prepare a colonized plant, inoculated plant and non-inoculated plant. This is field inoculation experiment. Uh, top photograph shows before transplanting, we prepared randomized block design. And the bottom photograph shows middle of growth and the harvest of Welsh onion. We harvested the shoot and the root. This is mycorrhizal colonization at the four phosphorus levels. Mycorrhizal colonization shows uh, presence of mycorrhizal fungi in the roots of host plant. Zero mean uh, absence of mycorrhizal fungi in the root. 100% shows uh, four part of root were colonized by mycorrhizal fungi. Blue color shows colonization of inoculated plant. And the white circle shows colonization of uninoculated plant. There was indigenous mycorrhizal fungi in field soil. Therefore, there was also colonization in uninoculated controlled plants. This is shoot phosphorus content of inoculated plant and control, uninoculated controlled plant. Blue circle, is higher than that of white circle. This means mycorrhizal ino fungal inoculation increased shoot phosphorus uptake of arium fistulosum at four phosphorus levels. This is shoot fresh weight. Blue color shows shoot fresh weight of inoculated plant. White circle shows shoot fresh weight of uninoculated control plants. Blue color, blue circle was higher than that of control. This means mycorrhizal colonization increased shoot fresh, uh, shoot fresh uh, yield of Arium fistulosum. And difference between inoculated plant and control was higher at low and medium phosphate level. And the difference becomes smaller at higher phosphorus level. This means mycorrhizal inoculation of mycorrhizal colonization is effective at low to medium phosphorus level. This is photograph of yield of Arium fistulosum. Left side shows uninoculated control. Increasing of phosphorus concentration of soil increased growth of Arium fistulosum. On the other hand, 
right side is growth of inoculated plant. There was no difference between yield of inoculated plant at among four phosphorus levels. Again, this figure shows in conventional system, a farmer applied a higher level of P fertilizer, but uh, agricultural system with inoculation of mycorrhizal fungi, farmer can reduce phosphorus level from 1,000 to 300. That means uh, shoot fresh weight of inoculated plant about 200 gram. This is the same as an inoculated plant at 1,000 level. So uh, orange line shows farmer can reduce phosphate fertilizer application with inoculation of mycorrhizal fungi. And the uh, balance of P fertilizer and um, mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, super phosphate is the name of uh, phosphate fertilizer. So price, uh, kilogram per US dollar and application rate. Gromus R10 is mycorrhizal fungi, commercially available in Japan. So total amount of money is 5,000 US dollar per hectare. On the other hand, uh, price of Gromus R10 was 2,000 US dollar per hectare. So totally, farmer uh, reduce uh, cost of production of Arium fistulosum, uh, 3,000 US dollar. But uh, so uh, price of P fertilizer and the price of uh, mycorrhizal fungi inoculum determine this balance. This is one of the examples carried out in Japan. We also carried out a similar inoculation experiment under 12 field in Japan. We prepared the inoculated plant and the uninoculated plant. So we prepared the three phosphorus level, P0, P50, and P100. And the y-axis shows uh, yield difference. Zero means no difference between control and inoculated. And the positive value shows increase of yield by mycorrhizal colonization. So at the P0 level, growth of uh, allium fistulosum increased by inoculation of mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, this, on the P100 level, some shows negative value. This means mycorrhizal fungi uh, worked as uh, parasitic. So mycorrhizal, effect of mycorrhizal fungi is higher in low and medium phosphorus level. In natural system, there is indigenous mycorrhizal fungi. We used to commercial introduced fungi. And uh, in natural condition, inoculated mycorrhizal fungi interact with indigenous mycorrhizal fungi. So we tracked uh, inoculated mycorrhizal fungi and uh, introduced in indigenous mycorrhizal fungi under a sterilized field condition. It is not easy to sterilize the field. We applied dazomet. Dazomet is one of fungicide to kill all microorganisms in soil. We prepared minus dazomet in no uh, control and plus dazomet mean dazomet killed all bacteria or fungi in the soil. And we transplanted the inoculated plant and uninoculated plant. So this means uh, application of dazomet killed native mycorrhizal fungi. And uh, inoculation increased shoot phosphorus uptake and shoot dry weight. And finally, this graph shows in sterilized soil uh, introduced mycorrhizal fungi increased growth of, uh, growth of uh, Arium fistulosum. Next, finally, Acquisition of unavailable phosphorus by avascular mycorrhizal fungi. There is available phosphorus and unavailable phosphorus. Mycorrhizal fungi take up H2PO4 minus. This is available soil phosphorus as the same as plant root. On the other hand, uh, in soil, aluminum phosphate, iron phosphate, inositol phosphate, nucleic acid, phospholipid, sugar phosphate are unavailable soil phosphorus. But 20 to 80 percent of soil phosphorus are unavailable. So it is necessary to use this unavailable force. Until now, there are several publications show the possibility of acquisition of unavailable phosphorus by mycorrhizal fungi. We prepared two compartmental culture system to collect the high fat of mycorrhizal fungi. 
by this system, we collected the soil solution with high oxidate of mycorrhizal fungi. And we detected the cytric acid in soil solution of inoculated plant. So we used this system to collect high oxidate. This is root organ culture of mycorrhizal fungi. Center photograph shows uh, root organ culture of mycorrhizal fungi. And we uh, clarified, uh, uh, we uh, uh, activity staining of the gel uh, revealed acid phosphatase activity at 187 kilo Dalton was observed exclusively in the presence of the fungus in the solution obtained from the mycorrhizal and hyphal compartment in the soil solution. This activity was also detected in the extracts of extralogical hyphae grown both in the sand culture and the in vitro monogenic culture system. So this shows uh, extralogical hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi uh, release acid phosphatase to hyphosphere soil. And we also clarify the effect of phosphorus concentration on the activity of acid phosphatase at 3 and 30 micromolar. So this figure shows, uh, y-axis shows acid phosphatase activity of cell wall bound and uh, medium uh, high oxidate. And uh, 3 micromolar is low phosphorus. And uh, phosphatase activity was higher at 3 micromolar than 30. And the phosphatase activity was not detected in high oxidate at 30 micromolar. This means phosphorus deficiency increased uh, release of uh, phosphatase activity from extralogical hyphae. So our result uh, shows uh, extralogical hyphae of mycorrhizal fungi release organic ash and phosphatase to soil. Organic ash and phosphatase produce available phosphorus. Inoculation of mycorrhizal fungi can contribute phosphorus recycle and achieve sustainable crop production. In conclusion, inoculation with mycorrhizal fungi reduces the amount of phosphate fertilizer application and the cost of cultivation. Second, introduced avascular mycorrhizal fungi colonized, colonized root until harvest in fumigated soil and increased plant growth. And finally, avascular mycorrhizal fungi release acid phosphatase from extralogical hyphae into the hyphosphere and Sorbidize in unavailable phosphorus. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for Professor Kitaro Tawaraya. He has used time 18 minutes. Thank you for that. Name is now is question and answer. I have some question on room chat for Professor Christian. Come again. You have read or oh, I would like to show you or oh, what I will read the question. Okay, actually uh, I already <laughs> answered uh, the, the questions uh, in the chat room. I mean, in, in the chat function, but I, I will be repeating my my answers to some of the questions which I failed to answer. And First after, question. After we finish, I will continue on the question for Professor Kitaro. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, is it my turn or? Yeah, you you turn. Yeah. Okay. Can you sh can you show again the the slide that that. The questions uh, on the slides. I think I already answered most of them uh, based on the 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 ones that I type in, in in the chat function. So, how many level concentration? Uh, the, the the acceptable level of mycotoxins. Uh, it depends on the mycotoxin. Well, I, I, I in my presentation I dealt with two kinds of mycotoxins: aflatoxins and pumonisins. For aflatoxins, the, the acceptable limit is uh, 20 microgram per kilogram, uh, which is actually uh, con cons consistent across 
several uh, regions of the world, like Europe, United States of America, and Asia, we use that 20 kilogram per microgram. Exceeding that amount will will lead your the products to be unacceptable for human and human consumption. For pumonisins, it's actually not yet uh, uh, not yet uh, fully determined. I mean, in some countries like Europe, they would uh, uh, say 1,000 microgram per kilogram. But in the Philippines, there's no legal limits yet uh, available. I don't know in Indonesia. I'm not. I'm not familiar with it in Indonesia. So the kinds of aflatoxins in the Philippines. Actually, the major ones, aplatoxin B1, B2, uh, M1, M2, all of those aplatoxins are present. But the main the predominant one is aplatoxin B1, which is the most uh, carcinogenic and potent. We can use PDA medium, of course, but there are some better media for mycotoxin or for aspergillus identification, malt extract agar. Or, or other selective media. Um, well, from the perspective of COVID-19, uh, well, we, we should not uh, ignore, as what, we should not ignore the, the threat of mycotoxins as well, because this deals with uh, food safety, you know? I think I failed to mention in my talk that uh, way back in the 1980s, there were some uh, cases of liver cancer, uh, the liver cancer among children in the Philippines because of they could because of the uh, consumption of contaminated uh, grain samples. So it's it could be causative, you know, it can really cause uh, cancer. So it really poses a detrimental effects on humans as well as animals. So the last question from Dr. Tamrin, we know based on our data that it's not only the environment, the climate, the temperature, relative humidity, but also the geographical location. You know, Indonesia is very much located near the equator, uh, nearer than the Philippines. So based on our studies, uh, uh, aflatoxin B1 is more prevalent in Indonesia, particularly in corn. But in the case of, you know, it depends on the crop, but in the case of coconut, we have higher levels of uh, aflatoxin B1. Uh, I don't know about the factor of uh, nutrient uh, depletion. There has not been any, well, I'm not familiar with the study, but it's not, in, you know, it's not part of the study in which we try to determine the if there's a decrease in nutrients, but you can detect mycotoxin even as early as a, you know three to five days after inoculation of the substrate. I think I hope I didn't miss any other inquiries. Okay, thank you, Professor Kumagun. Uh, I'll continue to Professor Tawaraya. You got the question? Yes. Prof? One from Rahmawati Hasid. You see in room chat? Yes, could you? Uh, first question from Professor Dawi is uh, number one. Uh, we you we use several avascular uh, mycorrhizal fungi, and uh, in Japan there are uh, commercial mycorrhizal fungi, Gromus uh, uh, rhizophagus irregularis. Former name is Gromus, and we use that for some crops. And uh, next uh, time of application, yes, uh, in depending on crop species. For horticultural crops, we usually use seedling under nursery one month or two months with sterilized soil. So during nursery stage, we sow seed and apply fertilizer and inoculate 
mycorrhizal fungi. So during one or two months, mycorrhizal fungi colonize and we can prepare colonized seedlings and the colonized seedlings uh, is transplanted to field. On the other hand, uh, for direct sowing uh, in the field, we sow seed and we apply chemical fertilizer to the field. But there is uh, indigenous mycorrhizal fungi. So if we uh, inoculate at the time of so, uh, at direct sowing at the field, indigenous mycorrhizal fungi uh, interact with introduced commercial mycorrhizal fungi. So sometimes uh, indigenous fungi can colonize and introduced fungi failed to colonize. So we usually use uh, trans uh, seedling preparation and the transplanting system. And next from Dr. Rahimawari, uh, mechanism of taking up available phosphorus. General mechanism of uptake of phosphorus by avascular mycorrhizal fungi is extension of extra radical hyphae from uh, root. So extra radical hyphae elongate uh, longer than 10, cent 10 centimeter from uh, root surface or hyphal density at the soil is uh, several uh one higher than one meter one meter per gram soil so this extensive growth of extra radical hyphae take uh, up more available phosphorus h2po4 minus and uh, next question professor karimuta karimuna uh Uh, how many percent of reduction of P fertilizer by the? This is depending on crop plant. So in Japan, horticultural crops, farm applied much, much P fertilizer. So we can reduce application of P fertilizer for horticultural crops, 30%, 50%. But uh, other crops like uh, uh, other crops uh, applied with a small amount of fertilizer. So percentage is smaller in such crop. And the marginal soils, marginal soils, we never tried to, uh, ah, ma marginal soil mean um, low pH, low phosphorus soil. So we don't have any data of percentage of reduction of P fertilizer at the marginal soil. But uh, in marginal soil, mycorrhizal fungi can also reduce application of P fertilizer. That's all to the question. Thank you very much to both of you, Professor Kumagun and Professor Tawaraya. We still have about nine or eight more minutes. If any question, please raise hand or you can directly talk and deliver the question to Prof. Kumagun or Prof. Tawaraya. Any question, any more questions? Yes, any more questions? Okay. Uh, if not, I will end this session. First session for invited speakers. And, and before that, the committee would like to take the picture. And could you please open your
computer or laptop or mobile phone the organizing committee will take the picture now Committee, how, how, how many times? Topic, topic. You have question? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for moderator. Can okay. I? Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, Christian. Are you remember me? Oh, yes, yes. I'm Taufik. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I met you uh, so many years ago with the Pathology Society in Georgia. Yeah. Are you okay? Nice memories, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I have a question. Of course. The first, uh, according to the data, you found uh, Asper, Aspergillus, Panje more compared than others. Why? It's okay. Uh, are you this referring to uh, the one in the Philippines or in Indonesia? Sorry, sorry. The first question. Why uh, you more aspergillus pine your sample compared than others? Uh, is it the one in the Philippines or Indonesia? In the in Philippines, in Philippines. In oh, Philippines. okay. Yes. The second uh, question. No, no. Okay. The second question. Go ahead. Uh, you say any, maybe any other uh, factor that cause increase the aplatoxin contamination uh, beside rainfall. Maybe like a question from Mr. Tamrin, but uh, I mean in open field, not in storage. Uh, any other factor uh, cause increased aplatoxin contaminant beside and rainfall. Thank you, Christian. Nice to meet you. Oh, yes. Of course. Thank you, Taufik, for that uh, wonderful question. So first, I'd like to tackle the first question. Uh, uh, well, we based on our da data, we found that... Uh, Aflatoxins are the predominant mycotoxins. Yes. That this is for for corn for maize. Yes. Um, basically, from what we have observed from from the from the uh, samples that we've gathered, there are some uh, symptomatic samples. Meaning, you can you can uh, obviously see the the growth of the aspergillus growing mm. on the corn samples. Those black it could be black uh, fungal growth to uh, greenish yellow. So yeah. there, there's an association between symptoms and the amount of uh, aplatoxins present in the corn samples. So that's probably one of the reasons why uh, it's the most common. Uh, also, I would also say that it also depends on the, the place. You know, I've, we found in the Philippines that in the northern part, there, aplatoxin may not be the most common. It could be pumonisins, which are the toxins produced by pumon by fusarium. But in most parts, uh, aplatoxins are predominant. Mm -hmm. And so it really depends on the location. It depends on the, the condition of the samples we, we, we get. So if there is heavy contamination of these green uh, bl black structures, then it's most likely aspergillus will be the most common uh, species to isolate. Now, second question, uh, apart from uh, temperature, like climate, relative humidity, rainfall, uh, what we're driving at in our work is that the ge geography, the location also is a major factor. Uh, we, we can see that, <laughs> geographically speaking, 
the location of Indonesia in the globe, which is very near the equator, in which very there, there will be high relative humidity, high temperature, very conducive for fungal growth. And so we say uh, aflatoxins is very much more problematic than in Indonesia than in the Philippines, because Philippines is, not, is located a little bit far away from the equator. That's probably one of the additional factors that we could say geographic location of the country. And obviously in, in temperate countries, aflatoxin, you cannot find aflatoxins in, in Europe. Even, I don't know, probably in the United States, I'm not sure, but in Europe, in particular in Germany, aflatoxins are not yet detected, you know? So I think that's, those are the major uh, factors, yeah. Uh, climate, temperature, relative humidity, water, and geographic location. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Answer, I mean answer. Uh, Aflatoxin is very dangerous because it's carcinogenic. Oh, yes. Uh, but this is uh, one of the less studied, you know, uh, right. research. We don't know much about it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Taufik. Christian, thank you, Pak Moderator. Prof. Taufik. Thank you, Professor Christian Kumagun. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you for Kaitaro Tawaraya. Yes. Uh, before ending, the committee will give you the certificate of appreciation for your presentation. Both of your presentation are very valuable research results. Then, then probably we can continue in Indonesia, especially for Professor Muhammad Taufik and other, other college in Halule University and also for Kitaro Tawaraya yeah, in soil and your entomology. Thank you very much. And now please, uh, could you receive your Certificate of Appreciation, and you can see it on the screen. Please show the, the certificate. That's for Christian Joseph R. Kumagun. And then to Professor K. Taro Tawaraya. And again, thank you so much. Thank you very and much. Thank you, Thank you. We will take the picture for our history. Finish? Okay. Thank you. I finished my job and will be continued on by Professor Ansarullah for the next session, the second session. And then I will give back to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Professor Sahta Ginting for excellently moderating the first session. And for the next session, who will lead by the Professor Ansharula? Please welcome Professor Ansharula. Kami undang Bapak Professor Ansharula untuk menjadi moderator pada sesi kedua. Kepada Bapak, kami persilakan dengan hormat. Okay, thank you very much for the time. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. I would like to continue the next session, in the second session.
we will listen to the presentation of three invited speakers. Professor Irwan D. Jaswir, uh, Kate, Katie Ricketts, and Dr. Tsipumi Takagi. In the first opportunity, I would like to invite Professor Iswandi Irwandi Jaspier. Before I give the time to Professor Jaspier, I would like to introduce briefly the academic and professional background of him. He was the King Faisal Prize 2008 laureate in service to Islam. He graduated from Food Technology and Human Nutrition at Bogor Agricultural University, or IPB. He then pulled studies at Masters in PhD level at University Putra, Malaysia, and was conferred a Masters of Science in Food Science and Biotechnology in 1996, and PhD in Food Chemistry and Biochemistry in 2000. In the year of 1998 to 1999, University Putra Malaysia has given him the opportunity to participate in the PhD exchange program at the Department of Food, Nutrition and Health of the University of British Columbia, Canada. The pinnacle of Professor Jaswi's quest of achieving academic excellence was his postdoctoral fellowship in lipid biochemistry at the National Food Research Institute in Tsukuba, Japan, in 2006 up to 2008. Prover Professor Is Irwandi Jaswir's contribution to the Islamic world has uniquely carved the edge in the development of scientific knowledge by establishing and developing a new discipline term halal science. Professor Jaswir, dedication to the scientific research is sound in the publication of over 200 articles in scientific journals, 34 book chapters, completed over 30 research projects, and presented more than 250 papers in internal conferences. Please welcome Professor Irwandi. It is your time now for about 15 minutes. Please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Bapak Professor Asarullah, for your kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for uh, kindly inviting me to this uh, prestigious event, uh, High Calf 2021. Um, allow me to uh, share my, my slide here. The title I would like to share with all the participants this morning is uh, Global Halal Industry and Food Security. Uh, can you see my slide, Prof? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, again, my name is Irwandi Jaswir. Currently, I am attached to International Institute for Halal Research and Training, International Islamic University, Malaysia. Um, okay, just now Professor Sola mentioned, did mention that uh, I received the award 2018 for my contribution in the development of a new discipline called Halal Science. What is Halal Science? Halal Science basically is looking at the perspective um, of Halal, non-Halal, Islamic jurisprudence, but from different angle, instead of uh, religious perspective, instead of fiqh, sharia, etc., we look at the halal and haram issues from the perspective of science and technology. This is what we have done in the last uh, more than 20 years. We completed 35 research projects related to halal, published papers, uh, patents, um, uh, books and book chapters, uh, scientific awards, including the I received the Habibi Awards in 2013, 
in the field of medicine and biotechnology. And current, uh, my current is in the third year for Google Scholars and 21 in the uh, Scopus. Ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about halal, now everyone is talking about this issue. Halal is no longer and, and uh, taken care of almost everyone people uh, talk about this. Why? Because it is a huge market. Some said the market is three over three trillion US dollars a year. And among the most uh, uh, fastest growing yeah, industry. Uh, when we look at this uh, uh, sector in halal, it could uh, include halal food, halal pharmaceutical, halal cosmetics, uh, supplement, halal traveling, etc. Okay, and then you, you see this uh, per sector, it is a huge market. Unfortunately, this is a homework for Indonesia. We as a Muslim largest, yeah, the largest Muslim population in the world, with more than 220 million Muslim, we are not yet the key players in the halal, uh, global halal industry. We know that we have the potential. We have our agricultural sector is very, very strong. Unfortunately, somehow we are not the players yet. If we do not produce halal food, halal products, yeah. or halal services, yeah. other country, yes? Yeah, penjat lagi. Uh, other country will take the opportunity. If you look at the global Islamic economy indicator, we are ranked number four in the world, uh, jumping yeah, from number 10 or 11 some, some years ago. But the, 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 the questions to us is that how much actually we receive for our economics, yeah, the, the revenue that we get from this industry. Are we getting enough? Are we uh, um, um, enjoying the, the industry, 3.1 trillion, or are the countries take opportunity? If we see this, there are some paradox. Uh, countries like Australia, New Zealand, they are now among the leaders in the halal meat and poultry. Country like uh, uh, Brazil is uh, number one in the poultry industry, halal uh, chicken, for example. And in Southeast Asia, Thailand enjoy very much the halal industry, even though they have only 5% Muslim. This is a challenge that we have to look into it and uh, very carefully, and we take uh, opportunity, the strategy, we arrange the strategy, we discuss together, we sit together how to overcome that problem. Oh, from my observation, um, um, in the last 20 years, you know, what I have seen in Indonesia, we do not have a, a strong halal ecosystem yet. Yeah. Now we realize that the government take um, uh, attention on this, and then uh, now they start developing the ecosystem. But when we compare Indonesia and Malaysia, for example, in Malaysia, almost all the uh, ministries and government agencies, there is a halal unit or division in the office. So this is what made Malaysia rank number one for over 10 years. And uh, this is a good example to me because if we want to take the opportunity, we are not take, we are not talking about the Islamic or religious perspective. No, we are talking about the halal business. We are talking that that can influence our welfare, our people, the economy of our people, etc. Uh, of course, during the pandemic, some of the sectors are very much affected, like traveling, yeah, Islamic traveling. Uh, uh, Sharia traveling or halal travel, but uh, some sectors like halal food, this is our concern today, and also halal pharmaceutical, that is not much affected. Uh, even there is, we can say that the, the, the growth is still there, and it is predicted in 2023, it will increase a lot. So this is, again, this is opportunity. After the pandemic, this is opportunity to us 
to produce the right agricultural product that can support our halal industry. For example, in 2018, I was invited to the National Assembly building. The left side picture is the National Assembly building. This is the parliament building. I was invited by the members of the parliament, a group of members of parliaments in Seoul, talking uh, about halal meat and poultry. And now South Korea are producing halal meat and poultry because they have the industry already. What they do not have at the time was at the halal perspective. Okay, and then, uh, then the right uh, picture here is that my, when I was invited to give a talk in Busan, Dong Ai University, the largest uh, private university in South Korea, where I was invited to give a talk on Muslim friendly hospitality and tourism. Yeah, so this is even imagine, yeah, in South Korea, a non Muslim country, but there is a program. Uh, of, offered by the university. The name is uh, Muslim Friendly Hospitality and Tourism. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are three main issues when we talk about the halal science. Number one is uh, raw materials. Number two is uh, processing. And number three, authentication. And these three are the domain of scientists in the university. I really hope and expect that uh, uh, my colleagues from Universitas Haluoleo will take uh, part in the development of halal science because uh, we have uh, agriculture uh, uh, sectors in Indonesia. The concept of halal uh, is clear, very clear. We know this, it must be halal from A to Z, from farm to plate, from source of origin till storage and distribution. But we also know that in every step of this, there is post, post potential for non-halal contamination. For example, in the slaughterhouse, in the processing plant, for example, or the uh, addition of uh, ingredients and food additive, etc. For example, this uh, some uh, critical areas here uh, for pigs and its byproducts, pork, the meat of the pig, lard, uh, fats of the pig, and also gelatin, the protein, all these three are very, very much um, available in the market. So we have to ensure that our uh, halal product is not contaminated with, with this. And next also enzyme, rennet for example, whether the animal that we use, we extract the rennet come from is slaughtered according to Islam or not. Uh, pepsin and trypsin are two uh, enzymes that I use uh, very much in food industry and also in, in medical, medicinal, and also uh, pharmaceutical, emulsifiers, intoxicants, etc. Uh, because we know that this pig animal, uh, all the product and derivative from this animal have been used for uh, commercial uh, application, including the hair of this animal. The hair of pig is, is used to extract cysteine, and amino acid used in the bakery industry. Also the tooth for toothbrush, a brush for our kids to draw for example, or the brush for uh, uh, um, females to bake, make bakery at home, etc. That's why authentication is very, very important. This is the role of our uh, university scientists. Uh, what we have done for example in our laboratory in the last 20 years, we use infrared spectroscopy, electronic NOS, DSC, DNA, ELISA, PCR, yeah, for example, chromatography, biopotential telemetry, etc. They contribute to more than 200 papers that we have uh, published. What about Indonesia? We are lacking of uh, gelatin, for example, halal gelatin. We know that the gelatin, 65% of the gelatin in the world are derived from pig and it's non halal and 30% from halal animal, but the slaughtering process might be questionable. <clears throat> Indonesia import a lot of halal gelatin a year. We don't have any a single uh, gelatin manufacturer in Indonesia that considered big. Uh, last year, I, we produced this book and launched by our uh, Minister of Research and Innovation and Research Technology, I mean. And then in this book, 
I uh, found that uh, Indonesia has a very, very good potential for uh, food additive from our, our uh, uh, agriculture resources. Unfortunately, we still import a lot. Yeah, apart from gelatin, flavors, uh, lorazine, seasoning, enzyme, food color, antioxidant, etc., we import in the large quantity. This is, of course, this is the challenges for compliance of halal uh, and quality requirements. Basically, there are three areas that we can do in the lab. Number one, analysis of oil fat base, protein base and DNA, and of course, alcohol base. Only three issues in halal industry. Very rare to see the carbohydrate issues here for halal now. Normally, only fat or protein or alcohol. This is example of this uh, our uh, research findings. We use FTIR for a transfer infrared spectroscopy. Using FTIR, we can get very very fast result, less than one minute. Uh, FTIR works based on the functional groups. Uh, for example, here in the wave number nine nine six five, we can get the, the the different concentration of light, meaning that this wave number can be taken as a marker. And then we use using a certain uh, software, we can develop uh, 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 how to distinguish halal and non-halal. This is uh, uh, electronic nose, and this is the spectrum. The good uh, electronic nose is uh, working on the volatile component, and from our finding, we can use electronic nose to distinguish halal and non-halal uh, lard uh, with other, compared to other fats or, or some uh, gelatin from lard and compared to other, other gelatin, for example, bovine. And here we can see the pork can be distinguished from chicken, beef, mutton, etc. Yeah. Uh, molecular techniques, of course, yeah, PCR has been used for halal detection far before COVID-19, yeah, people using PCR for uh, COVID. But uh, uh, in, in halal, uh, we can see clearly that uh, real-time PCR can be used. Yeah, and then you see pork, the spectrum is up, while chicken and beef, this, this uh, 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 straight line. And then the concentration can be also uh, detected. We use this technology to when we get a uh, very uh, huge grant yeah, from Saudi Arabia the other day, and we are as we were as yet to to check uh, the the cost the uh, halalness yeah, of the import product yeah, circulated in the market in Saudi at the time, and we found that this is some of the porcine DNA yeah, in that product. So what we do in this study is that we extract the gelatin from the food products, and then uh, from the gelatin we extract the DNA. Uh, that's why uh, gelatin research is very important. We have done more than 10 research on this, uh, including the latest one, a collaboration with Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta. Where we produce a gelatin from kulit kambing etawa here for pharmaceutical capsule. While with King South University, we studied a camel gelatin project to produce a camel gelatin, a gelatin from untai. This is what we have done. And then the, the issue is not only in Indonesia, in Malaysia also, uh, they are struggling yeah, to get the halal, halal um, uh, gelatin because they need to import. And that's why the government put initiative to establish a company, I mean, the manufacturing. Uh, this is pilot plan of gelatin and derivative in Malaysia. And this is our halal laboratory. This is the instrument machinery that we have for, for halal research. What the trends next? The trends to me is uh, we have to include uh, data science, the big data and, and uh, blockchain, for example, uh, must be incorporated in the halal research because a uh, country like Singapore and Thailand now in, 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 in uh, using blockchain for non-halal uh, traceability. Yeah, non-halal traceability. There are issues, yeah, 
in Malaysia uh, last year, I think that uh, the meat imported from other country are mixed in the middle, uh, all contaminated with non-halal. And then the same issue, I think I read some time ago in Bandung, Indonesia, where halal meat is mixed up with the non-halal meat. Second is the device for rapid test. Not all the analysis, all not the pe people need to bring the sample to the lab. It's very costly and takes time sometimes. So what we need is a device that is ready to be used by ordinary people. Yeah, and then halal authentication in the digital platform. This is the role of the university. The question is whether our research has been in the stage of uh, collaboration with industry or not. Your country like Korea, Japan, yes. The blue one means that you are engaging with the industry, different from the red or green one where your research still in that, the output the research in the papers and and then there sometimes only the thesis of the students. These 10 science and technology drivers in the future, uh, next 30 to 50 years, perhaps, and six of them are related to IT. So the, the, the power of uh, information technology will be uh, much uh, influencing our life in the future. This is the device that we developed to detect a non halal large, yeah, large and, and alcohol, yeah. This is a very, the, the first version of the device. And then this is high pressure processing, new technology that can be used to produce gelatin better than the conventional one. And this is, uh, we use our fabricated, our own fabricated portable electronic nose to detect, um, um, what do you call this, uh, moss wash, yeah. The last one is, is a digital platform. This also innovation to help to help our SMEs, halal industry, to bring the product to the world. Yeah, this is one of the example. The company that use a digital platform to promote halal products. Of course, some other the challenges is the the standardization or the challenge of, of uh, certification, yeah? That number one, costly, sometimes number two is not uh, uh, similar, yeah, one to another, yeah? I think that's it that what I have uh, for today, they will can I can share with all the participants today. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, I return back to moderator. Hello. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Irwan Di Jaswir. It's very interesting uh, talk. And then please stay on because we are having a discussion after the uh, next or the third invited speaker. So we move on to the second invited speaker is Katy Ricketts from the CSIRO, Australia. Before she talk, let me introduce her briefly. She is a development economist interested in food system and agricultural value chains. In particular, how this network influences human health, nutrition, and poverty. Katie's work has analyzed the welfare risk and opportunities for linking smallholder farmers to market opportunities and the evolution of food value chains on urban and rural food security. Katie is originally from California, United States, and holds undergraduate and graduate degrees in international development and applied economics and management from University of California, Los Angeles, and Cornell University, respectively. She enjoys open water swimming and heads to the ocean whenever possible. Please welcome Katie Ricketts. It is your time now. Hi there, thank you so much. I will yeah. go ahead and share my screen. Okay, please. There we go.
great. So I hope you see that um, on the screen now. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for inviting me to speak. This is a real pleasure um, to be here and um, looking forward to hearing the any questions that might come out of this presentation. In Australia, we like to recognize the traditional owners of the land in which we um, work and live on. And so I wanna recognize the Ngunnawal people that, um, that are from this area of Australia that I'm presenting to you from. So I wanna share about our COVID-19 food supply chain impacts work and the early insights that we've learned about how Australia has been impacted, um, but there are lessons to be learned more generally other areas in the world um, that, that also might apply. So let me tell you a little bit about what I'll talk with you about today. So I'll share a little bit about our 2020 COVID-19 supply chain resiliency work, including some of the lessons that we've learned from that. But I really wanna underscore that context is really important. So as you know, um, you know, COVID is moving quickly and there's been lots of changes that have happened, um, you know, month to month, but certainly year to year, we're seeing um, the food supply chains globally and locally here in Australia really um, change. So um, these results from 2020 um, already have different levels of relevancy given what we're dealing with today um, with Delta. But I'll tell you a little bit about what we found in that early work. Um, I'll then move on and share a little bit about what we're seeing in 2021, the trajectory that we're on for some food, food system impacts. Um, and again, some of those learnings from our 2020 work do still apply, but some of them don't. And so I'll share a little bit about those things. Um, importantly, what we're seeing in 2021 is some real seismic and really huge impacts that are happening, um, both in labor, but also in what consumers are demanding of the food system. And this is placing um, pressures on um, both farmers, producers, um, suppliers, export markets, and, and really the whole food system. And so I'll share a little bit about some of those trends. And then I'll also explore some of the hypothesis that I'm working on in my research and some projects that are underway based on these 2021 trends. Um, and there's particular implications or possible applications to food security, both regionally, um, including in Indonesia, but in Australia as well, um, and throughout the world. So let me bring you back to last year, probably felt like forever ago, um, but when COVID hit in 2020, um, and that was in February, March for Australia, um, economists like me were thinking about a couple different things. We were thinking about, you know, what's the probability um, and possibilities of current supply shortages. We were really focused on that supply side. Um, were farmers and um, food producers going to be investing in their land, meaning we're we gonna see delays in planting schedules, delays due to machinery or inputs, et cetera. And then we were also really thinking about the impacts of stockpiling. So what stockpiling, it's when consumers get really concerned about potential shortages and they go buy up you know, something at a grocery store or a food retailer, and then we actually do have a shortage. So we were thinking about, okay, what are these impacts of stockpiling and are, are some of our food value chains gonna be able to respond to these big kind of demand pulses? Um, in late 2020, we were thinking about something quite different. We were thinking about um, what the previous, you know, six, eight months of COVID had really told us in terms of how consumers were responding. So consumers were doing things like cooking from scratch, with restaurants closed and um, you know, a lot of farmers markets and things like that closed. People were at home cooking for themselves and that was really changing the different things that they wanted to purchase. Um, they were purchasing very different things. We saw trends like um, people shopping much less frequently, but when they did go to grocery stores, they were buying much bigger baskets of food. So that meant challenges for retailers who were trying to keep an inventory of item, of a lot of different items available. Um, so we were thinking about how supply chains were, were agile and responding to these new kind of consumer behaviors. So that's what we were thinking about last year. And that um, is a backdrop for the lessons I want to share with you about what we learned in 2020 about how the Australian food system was reacting. So we developed a project in really starting in July, August of 2020, um, where we held qualitative interviews um, across three different supply chains or sectors, I should say, in Australia, beef, poultry, and citrus. 
Um, beef and citrus are huge export um, opportunities for Australia, and so they're really critical to our national um, GDP, our gross domestic product. Um, they employ a ton of people, and they're, they're really um, economically very important to Australia. Um, it's, they also provide food for the domestic market as well. Poultry is consumed more or less domestically, um, so we wanted to look at that as a contrast to export-driven chains versus domestic chains. And so we spent time talking to farmers, to um, people who operated packing houses, to people at meat um, processing plants, um, exports, traders, and then retailers. So all up and down the supply chain in these three um, different sectors, we were talking to people about what they were experiencing in those early months of COVID. So let me tell you a little bit about the lessons that we learned from that and what we heard. So the first thing that we learned was that Australia faced some favorable tailwinds. What does that mean? That means that it's a combination of being prepared and lucky, um, to be honest with you. So one of the first things that was really working in favor of Australia maintaining um, adequate levels of food supply, but also um, continuing to um, have confidence in our agricultural markets, and so we saw a lot of investment continuing to happen. Um, one of those um, so sort of first tailwinds that we saw and, and learned about was global market conditions, in particular grain markets. The grain markets at that um, in 2020 were much better than they were um, in the previous couple of years. And that's important because grains are critical input into the global agricultural system for things like livestock, for things like bread, for really basic food supply, food supplies that people um, need and want, um, and they're really critical inputs. So there was enough flexibility in the global markets that if there was a supply chain that was constrained by, say, shipping or government policies or whatever it might have been at the time, a trader could look to other options in the global market to source that grain. So Australian producers really benefited from that, but that was really experienced um, by a lot of countries um, throughout the world. So that was, a, that was a really favorable thing that happened to be happening. Um, the other thing that Australia really benefited from is this combination of timing and labor. So the harvest, the sort of main harvest period for Australia, one of the main harvest periods is, is really February through March. So by the time COVID hit, the labor that we needed to have in the country, a lot of Australia, uh, a, lot, a lot of Australian agriculture is harvested by labor that comes from outside the country. A lot of those laborers were already in the country ready to work. So when the border shut, there really there wasn't a labor shortage because those those people were already there. So that timing was good from that from that front. Um, the, there's not a lot of good things coming out of COVID, but the timing in that particular dimension for um, Australia at least was beneficial. So that was really kind of the first, let's say category of things that we learned about Australia and COVID. The second thing was that Australia really benefited from um, some supply chain redundancies. It's interesting because I keep hearing in these conversations with other economists about agricultural impacts and COVID, about this focus on domestic supply chains. We'll be okay if we have, a, you know, if we're growing and consuming all of our food domestically. What we found is that that really wasn't true. That the the strength of Australia in this in this particular example in 2020 at least was that it was a mix of long and short supply chains that really helped ensure national food security and 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 food stability. Um, so these complex supply chains, they let's let's call them long supply chains. Those supply chains benefited from early warnings in other countries. So let me give you an example. A meat processor in Australia um, was learning lessons from the experience of COVID in the United States and then telling their supply chain partners how they could prepare for you know, COVID waving through Australia because of what they had learned in Australia so, or what they had learned in the US. So those early warnings were able to be transferred by large supply chains. So in that way, large supply chains or long supply chains benefited. But these kind of shorter local supply chains also were benefited because when there were delays in 
inventory um, from retailers. Retailers turned around and they started looking at local milk producers or they started buying um, local products from um, you know, some of these domestic producers to fill in the gaps um, in their inventory. And we've actually seen some of those local supply chains or shorter supply chains continue to be um, uh, you know, picked up by those retailers and, you know, they've continued to have a market opportunity available to them. So again, we've seen this mix of long and short supply chains that have been really helpful in ensuring um, uh, food security and food stability. Um, a real loser, I guess, of this, of uh, sort of COVID was what they call just-in-time supply chains. So those really, you know, those supply chains really de depend on um, the chains moving very quickly and they depend on logistics working pretty seamlessly to get products from A to B very quickly. And with all the lags in transportation, we saw those chains that had a business model that was what we call a JIT business model. They really collapsed overnight. So to give you an example, we had um, a chicken, a poultry producer that was producing um, uh, sort of high-end expensive chickens for restaurants and they were flying in these you know specific types of birds from a particular area of the country and then selling them to um, big urban markets in Sydney and Melbourne and you know that collapsed overnight because there wasn't the flights coming in and then there also wasn't the re the, re the restaurants that were open to actually um, uh, you know, consume, consume those types of products. So when the supply chains were that tight, we saw those, those linkages really, really break. Um, so I'll move on to learning number three. There were definitely, a, there were a lot of things that we learned about, let's call them suboptimal supply chain responses to COVID-19. So two, two things that have really caught our attention as a research organization, and we're really thinking hard about how we provide research service to these kind of two big, what we think of as like vulnerabilities in the Australian system. So one is how do we um, create supply chains and a food system that can respond very quickly to consumer demand shifts. Because what COVID did is literally overnight shift the way in which consumers were thinking about and consuming food. And it's been really hard for a lot of supply chains to adjust very quickly to those new realities. So what are some of those new demands? Consumers are actually demanding different types of products. So I mentioned before that a lot more people are cooking from home. So they want different types of products and different types of value add for those, those products. Um, Product attributes in terms of what consumers are seeking in the market are, are also changing. So what I mean by that is that sustainability is becoming a much bigger issue for a lot of our consumers here in Australia. So that means supply chains need to be collecting data and working with, you know, up and down the chain to make sure that they're meeting those sustainability criteria requirements in the market. Um, the other things that uh, we are working with our food supply chains to understand and help them prepare for is around um, online and e-commerce shopping. So very different model, different types of um, you know, storage issues, different ways that retailers are going to work with their suppliers around e-commerce. And we're thinking a lot about how those supply chains can be ready to go digital and have a digital footprint and go online. So that's kind of what's going on in the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, there's a whole area that we're working on around wide-ranging labor challenges that have been exposed through COVID. So as I mentioned before, a good portion of the harvest labor that's necessary for Australian agriculture comes in from outside the country. And that's a combination of, um, of Pacific Island visas that come in to support, as well as our, um, you know, young backpackers groups who come in and, you know, they work on a farm and then they also are awarded um, a visa opportunity to stay in the country and recreate or do travel or whatever it is they might want to do. And those people might come from any number of countries that have that type of visa arrangement with Australia. But increasingly, there's been a labor shortage. And so those um, shortages with, restrict with additional restrictions happening through COVID would really present problems in the future for Australian agriculture and getting 
the quantity and quality of product harvested in time at different areas within different areas of the country. Um, that's just been a real vulnerability that we've highlighted. So we're thinking through investments that can be made not only in automation, but also in um, in just improving uh, that as a desirable job for people. So. That could mean investments in things like housing. It could mean improvements in the visa program. There's a number of different policy angles that you could take, but we're trying to understand what would incentivize people to want to um, do more work in agriculture. So those are the two big areas that we learned are potential risks and 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 could be opportunities for us if we're able to to meet meet the moment. So our 2020 takeaway, as I just was saying, was around consumer behavior and retailing. So we have a whole work, line of work going on there, whole line of work happening around labor challenges and solving those labor challenges. And I will move to this next one. So in 2021, we're thinking about um, different aspects of um, the food system. So a number of things happened this year. One huge one that everyone knows about is Delta. Delta has really created a lot of challenges globally for the food system to manage, because it means that certain areas of the world are sort of erupting with really challenging virus conditions. And that's doing a number of different things, including making logistics a real mess right now. So you'll pro you're probably seeing this in various things that you're reading or newspapers. I'm showing just a few articles from some Western media there on the right hand side, but logistics are really a mess. We're anticipating massive delays in shipping and transportation, not only for food and agriculture, but really for everything. Um, the costs of shipping and freight have gone up astronomically. And so producers and exporters are really thinking about the kind of business models that are gonna be able to overcome those challenges and governments um, and research organizations like ours are thinking about what are the long-term investments that we might need in order to, to overcome these kinds of challenges. And again, I mentioned that um, part of this is fueled by Delta, which is um, underpinned by kind of this pent up demand, what we think of as, you know, people being in lockdown, buying things online, um, et cetera. This kind of consolation purchasing is kind of what I think about it as. In addition to these demand surges that happen when people are out of lockdown, when they really want to go, um, you know, do other things or do a lot more online purchasing. And there's a whole bunch of behavior shifts that changes. So we're seeing these really, um, this explosion of uh, demand that's really causing a bottleneck globally for agriculture or for um, all types of products, but agriculture is getting caught up in that as well. And so we're really thinking through what the consequences of that again might be for the long term. Price increases, what does this mean in terms of product and input delays? How might that affect farmers and their planting schedules and things like that? Long-term investment decisions for how land should be used profitably. Um, these are all big question marks for us right now that we're um, interested in learning more about. So um, this is a, a few of the things that I've been thinking about recently that I just extend to you as some hypothesis about um, what these pressures on the food system might look like. So in particular with this really big question around labor, which is really kind of a global phenomenon right now. We have a massive reorganization of labor markets happening where it's not just knowledge workers, it's not just people in office jobs who are um, moving into different lines of work, but it's also low wage, casual and shift work. And that includes people who are there to harvest in agriculture or who are working um, lower skill or lower wage agricultural jobs. Um, if you can see in this chart on the right hand side there, that orange line is what we call our working holiday maker visas. So that's our imported labor that comes in from backpackers. And so in December 2013, you see, or 2019, sorry, you start seeing a big drop off and that is not returned for Australia. So we're still thinking through um, the long-term consequences of some of these labor shortages. And it's not just Australia, this is also happening in the US and other places um, where there's um, real issues with um, employing and retaining people in agricultural roles. Um, so as these labor markets again reorganize, we're, we're thinking about what the food system impacts of that are. Um, the second trend that I'm sort of seeing and trying to keep track of and, and think has a 
could have a real impact on food supply chains is the attention that labor practices are getting from buyers and retailers. So what do I mean by that? I mean that with a move towards uh, more transparent sustainability reporting, there's also a move towards more transparent labor reporting about labor and, and practices across the supply chain about how people working in those supply chains are treated. Um, so whole question around how that might affect um, food systems. Um, with that one. And then the last thing that we're thinking about regarding kind of COVID-19 and labor is the kind of accelerating impact of climate change. So as we see people migrating, not only because of COVID-19, moving to be near family or having new pressures and needing to change jobs, as I was saying before, or have a different strategy for their welfare, um, we're also seeing people move and migrate because of climate change impacts. And so in the long term, some of our work is, is hopefully going to look at what some of those migra migration changes might mean in terms of workforce availability for agriculture, both in Australia, but also globally is, is of interest as we think about kind of um, the portfolio of development work that we do as well. So um, many more questions than answers, but I'm really happy to give you a flavor of some of the things that we've been thinking about. And um, just really want to thank you for taking the time to hear about our work and, and looking forward to answering any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you, Katie. It's very interesting talk. And we have, we have many things we can learn from COVID-19 situation on the agricultural production, distribution and marketing, especially in the Australian experience. Uh, please stay on and we will have a question and answer later after talk of Sipumi Takagi. So we invite Sipumi Takagi for the last invited speaker. Uh, Miss Sipumi Takagi uh, is from National Chungsing University in Taiwan. She has graduated uh, PhD from Michigan State University in United States and Master of Arts in the University of Ryukyu, Okinawa, Japan. Uh, Sikumi Takagi has correlated with the Indonesian agriculture because her thesis uh, both from master and PhD degree is about the agriculture in uh, Indonesia, especially in West Java and Bali. Okay, uh, this time for your, for Sipu, to get, uh, Sipu Mitakagi, yeah? for your talk. Please. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay, please. Hello, uh, everyone. Um, first, uh, thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, also, uh, thank you very much for a uh, nice introduction uh, of myself. Um, my name is Chifumi Takagi. Uh, I'm from uh, National Jewish University in Taiwan. And today, I want to share uh, about the Taiwan's uh, experience of food security and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on agriculture in Taiwan. Um, since I'm not native speaker in English, but I do hope uh, you can understand my presentation in English. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, outline of my presentations. Yes. Uh, I believe uh, most of the people uh, in this conference knows about Taiwan, but let me uh, introduce uh, Taiwan briefly. Taiwan is a small island uh, located uh, in the southern part of Japan and the uh, east coast of China and the uh, north part of uh, Philippines. 
and the population is 23, uh, 23 million people. And uh, the area is about 36,000 square kilometers. And the GDP in 2017 is 572 billion US dollars. And the agriculture contribution GDP is about 1.7%. So actually, uh, the Taiwan, Taiwan, um, Taiwan's agriculture share in GDP is uh, pretty small. And uh, I am uh, coming from uh, Taichung, like central part of Taiwan. And Taiwan has a tropical and subtropical climate. The northern part of Taiwan, uh, the climate is uh, subtropical. However, Taiwan has a, a topic of Capricorn in Jai, and the southern part of Taiwan has the tropical climate. And the long and hot summer occurs from April or May to September or October. And the short and mid winter is typical in the north, although occasional snow falls in the mountains. In Taiwan, actually, the attribute uh, could be 4,000. Uh, there are, there are uh, more than 3,000 high uh, attribute mountains uh, in the central uh, areas of Taiwan. So um, we can observe um, the temperate. Uh, crops and also uh, from temperate to uh, tropical uh, crops in Taiwan. And its average annual temperature is 21 degrees Celsius. So actually it's a uh, pretty um, comfortable um, place. I can say that. And rainfall average about 2,500 millimeters per year. And most of which comes from typhoons. In Taiwan, um, we had many typhoons uh, during the summer, especially August, September, and October. And look at uh, the right side of the uh, graph. That is uh, Taipei's uh, weather conditions. Um, so you can see um, we had uh, many rains and also uh, like the hot temperature in July, August, and uh, still September. But uh, uh, this pattern is not same as southern part. Southern part is belong to the tropical area. Okay, so now let's move on to brief introduction of Taiwan's agriculture. In Taiwan, the major crops are rice, vegetables, tropical fruits, and flowers, and sugar canes. And uh, you can see the map of Taiwan. This is um, indicating the agricultural uh, land use uh, in Taiwan. And uh, the green uh, area is uh, showing the mountain or uh, forest. And uh, you can see the east and uh, west coast side uh, is uh, like, um, like, uh, Light, light, light orange. Uh, this is uh, the crop plant, and uh, we can find many, many different crops in the uh, uh, western coast. But of course, the eastern coast also uh, it's pretty famous uh, growing the rice. So, um, but only twenty four percent is the arable land in Taiwan. And um, the export uh, crops are uh, the pineapples, bananas, and tea and orchid seedlings. These are the uh, main uh, export crops uh, from Taiwan. And animal husbandry is pork and uh, chicken. Unfortunately, uh, many uh, Taiwanese people uh, do not eat uh, beef. Okay. So now I want to uh, 
share uh, some uh, information about food security related information in Taiwan. Taiwan is heavily dependent on imported food and agricultural products to limited arable land and the small agricultural sectors. And in 2020, Taiwan imported food, food mostly from the US, China, Brazil, New Zealand, Japan, and Thailand. And in 2018, Taiwan's food self-sufficiency rate was only 35%. This is uh, measured as a calorie based. And Taiwan's self-sufficiency rate in primary agriculture products are, this is a uh, average data from 2009 to 2018, aquatic products, 168.21%, egg, 100%, vegetables, 88%, fruits, 87%, and meat, almost 80%, but crop, 27%, and sugar and honey is almost uh, 10%. So these crops, um, you can see, um, produced Taiwan um, self-sufficiently, uh, more than 100%, or almost 100%, but uh, still, uh, Taiwan needed to uh, depend on uh, import from outside. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, look at what happened COVID-19 pandemic in Taiwan, 2020 and 2021. This is uh, data uh, from the first week of 2020 and uh, the 41 weeks of uh, this, this year. And uh, actually here, um, Taiwan has very small uh, wave uh, in uh, February in um, 2020. However, this year, May to July, we had the first big wave uh in 2021 that is uh almost three months but the taiwan government uh controlled um very well actually um i originally i'm from japan and what i experienced in tokyo last year uh that was i experienced in taiwan in may so i was kind of uh, looking back to last year's Tokyo's case, uh, what happened in uh, Taiwan uh, this May to uh, dry. This is a uh, map uh, where the uh, infected uh, case mostly come from. Uh, this is the information uh, most likely uh, from this year. And uh, you can see uh, Taiwan, uh, the northern uh, capital city areas, uh, New Taipei City or Taipei City, uh, the most of the case is come from uh, these areas. But also like Taichung City or like uh, like uh, Gaussians, um, these like dark um, chocolate uh, or dark orange area, the city areas uh, also we can uh, find uh, many cases uh, in Taiwan. But in the rural area, um, actually, uh, it is pretty um, okay. And uh, people are thinking, um, just uh, please do not come to the many people from the big cities. That is, uh, when I interviewed with the farmers, um, they are uh, telling uh, their honest feeding like that way. Okay, so now I want to uh, introduce uh, what was happened in 2020 in Taiwan. In contrast to the international COVID-19 outbreak, Taiwan's case are relatively stable. And actually Taiwan did a good job to control the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, situations last year. And Taiwan had worked with the US and other countries to develop uh, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, research and development, uh, disease uh, prevention material. And also Taiwan donated face masks to many countries and shared uh, their strategies and experiences of how to control COVID-19. And 
last year, actually, uh, Japan uh, also received uh, many donations of the uh, face masks from Taiwan. So from um, looking at uh, Japan's uh, policies or situation uh, from Taiwan, I really admired uh, Taiwan's uh, condition and situations. Okay, but please uh, look at what has happened in 2021. Taiwan went through an outbreak of COVID-19 from May 19th and July 23 and the national wide pandemic alert level three. And business remained operational, but shifted to workflow and work from home adapted. And Taiwan Central, Central Epidemic Command Center has imposed strict control measures to temporarily ban all foreigners without a permanent resident a permit from uh, entire, entering Taiwan. This condition is, uh, it uh, has been relaxed for the uh, international students and international researchers. However, uh, still uh, it's uh, strict for other international uh, peoples. And Taiwan has produced a COVID vaccine, uh, brand, branded Medigen vaccine uh, that is approved for emergency use by the Taiwan's government at the end of July. And by the end of September, the population's uh, first jab vaccine vaccination rate was 70%. And the second jab rate was below 30%. So actually, um, the Taiwan government uh, can control the current um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, conditions uh, now in Taiwan. In addition, what has happened in 2021? Actually, this is one of the uh, effects of the uh, climate change. A serious drought has occurred. The water outage, uh, this is 48 water outage uh, every week in the central Taiwan area from April to June. Actually, I was a victim of uh, this water outage. I couldn't use uh, 48 hours uh, per week um, in Taichung. And uh, rice production for the first cropping season has been canceled due to the government order. Um, in Taiwan, there are two uh, types of the uh, rice cropping seasons. First season is from uh, February to June, and second season is July to October. Compared to the first, uh, second seasons, uh, the first season uh, does not uh, have the damage from the typhoon, and also the production uh, is uh, bigger than the second season. However, uh, this year, uh, many of the rice farmers uh, should give up their rice production uh, due to the uh, drought. And also an adjustment to production in the industrial sector was needed. Actually, uh, the Taiwan's, uh, one of the uh, famous uh, company is called TSMC. This is a semiconductor company. Um, these companies also needed to reduce uh, their production levels due to the uh, lack of the water. And another big um, event on the agriculture is China's ban on fruit export. It was happened uh, for pineapple export in March. But this uh, actually, as a result, uh, increased export to Japan and other countries. And uh, as a result, uh, Taiwanese pineapple farmers uh, could increase their uh, amount of export to these other countries. However, recently, the China also announced uh, they ban uh, they, they ban uh, the from the uh, import from Taiwan wax apples and apple sugars in September. These are still uh, challenging for Taiwanese uh, farmers, and we really need to uh, find out the solutions for uh, farmers. Okay, then look at how it changed uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemics uh, changed people's life in Taiwan, especially. Um, this was, this was uh, I could see in May to uh, July in Taiwan. So change in domestic consumption patterns. So people take out from restaurant, 
because uh, government uh, banned to uh, open the restaurant and uh, the restaurant uh, only can provide the takeout options for their sales. The intention of shopping has decreased, but online shopping increased. So actually this is a uh, business chance uh, for many farmers and also um, retailers. And unfortunately, there are many cancellations of activities and events. And second, um, the change is travel decline and the decrease of movement. Limited and no tourists as a leisure farm or forest recreation parks. This is, um, I think it's not only Taiwan, but also we can see many, many uh, countries. And uh, as a result, um, these um, tourist uh, areas, um, hotels, uh, leisure farms, and uh, the traveling companies, uh, they had uh, received significant damage on that. Okay, since uh, Taiwan just finished uh, the first wave of the COVID-19 uh, waves, so I am still uh, interviewing these farmers. So this is uh, some impact on agricultural sectors in Taiwan um, by uh, observing uh, from my point of view. And also um, I, 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 I read uh, the newspapers in Taiwan and uh, I'm sorry, this is not the formal data, uh, but I want to share uh, what happened uh, in agricultural sectors in Taiwan due to the COVID-19. Farmers had difficulties selling their products at Alert Level 3. The Alert Level 3 is continued from middle of May to the end of July. And developing new selling method is essential for farmers. In fact, it is also a business opportunity. That is, I mentioned. The demand for online shops uh, has drastically increased. Uh, this is, I interviewed with uh, vertical uh, farming uh, companies and also um, organic uh, farming companies. And uh, both uh, of them um, told me um, they received more than uh, 20 times as the online uh, order uh, compared to the normal uh, period. So they are very, very busy uh, about uh, preparing and shipping uh, their product to the uh, consumers. However, after the first, first wave of uh, the pandemics, uh, the, the price of food and agriculture products has increased. That is, I can observe recently in Taiwan's uh, market. However, it's a maybe good news. Supermarkets have developed and improved ready to eat product. Especially, I'm really happy this can be uh, observed for the uh, fresh vegetables product. So before that, Taiwan has a uh, very uh, significant uh, eating out cultures. So every meal, uh, many people are uh, eating out. However, after the pandemic, uh, many people needed to stay in the house. So um, even younger generations, uh, they uh, switch uh, their eating habitat uh, by um, cooking by themselves. Okay, so that is all for uh, today from me, and thank you for your attention. And later, if uh, you have any questions, uh, please uh, let me know. Thank you very much. We now move on to the question and answer time. Uh, we have some question for Dr. Professor Irwan Dijaswir uh, to Miss Miss uh, Katie Katie Rigets and Dr. Sipumi Takagi. Uh, can you see in the chat room? Yeah. Okay. Please, uh, Prof. Irwandi. Uh, thank you, uh, Prof. Uh, moderator. I have um, read two questions for me here. 
one is from uh, Ibu Rania, I think. Thank you for a good present. Okay, uh, well, Prof. Rania uh, was asking about the blockchain technology the application in the halal industry. Uh, through blockchain technology, uh, a halal network so transaction is can be uh, seen. Yeah, uh, clearly the traceability can be done more accurately. And then I think this is the future of the halal industry. We know that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the halal supply chains is from A to Z. Um, we need the trusted yeah, traceability uh, and authentication in order to avoid um, uh, a lot of issues yeah, related to the halal integrity. For example, uh, recently, as I mentioned, uh, uh, there is um, a country in Malaysia the other day when they import from one place outside uh, halal meat, and in the middle, during the shipping, there is some contamination. But using blockchain technology, every step can be seen by everyone. And so this is the, the beauty of the blockchain technology. And, and then this is because uh, information and uh, through data science is when the information is shared. So traceability is, is the future to me. And currently the countries like uh, Thailand and also in Singapore for uh, uh, slaughterhouse, they're trying to use blockchain technology. Uh, that means that uh, if you want to slaughter this, this chicken, for example, this bird, and then we can see the, the history of the animal from it is born, it was born, you know, and then the second stage, stage and then next, and then how it was treated, how it was, it was fed yeah, by, by the animal feed, what kind of, so all the data are shared. So this is uh, why uh, uh, big data and blockchain would be uh, the, the future of the, halal industry. That's the first question. The second question from uh, uh, Madam, I think, Santa Ginting, Sata Ginting, yes, Sata Ginting, I think Prof. Sata Ginting. Um, I, I saw the question here, how, how would we collaborate? I think uh, actually our institute are open for collaboration, any collaboration uh, for example, for staff mobility, it would like to come. Of course, after the pandemic, after the border is open, you may come to our place in Malaysia, not far away from Indonesia, from your place. And then for staff mobility, you may uh, stay here for a few months, for example. You can send your students. We can work together applying the, the uh, research grant together. This is what we have done before with other institutions in Indonesia. And we can do shared publication. Uh, we work, we publish together. So uh, uh, then, yeah, we welcome any collaboration, any any proposal, and then you would like to work together with us. Thank you for your interest. Yeah, Pa Ansarullah, I think the two questions I have answered. Responded. Is is there any two other questions for Professor Jaswir? Yeah, this was also here uh, for the few here. Uh, is there any problem in socialize the halal meat uh, to all customer when the, the non-Muslim country? Yeah, uh, I think halal meat here. Yeah. Uh, um, basically, uh, at the moment, halal is seen as a halal, the lifestyle. So instead of, of, of um, uh, religious obligation, it is more, uh, uh, more toward uh, a lifestyle, healthy products, et cetera. So if we, the concept, this concept actually is aligned with the, the, the concept of halal and taiban in Islam. Halal is halal, clearly uh, permitted, but taiban means quality. 
So uh, in Islam, halal is always followed by tayyiban. Every word of halal is always followed by tayyiban. Meaning, if you can produce something halal and also tayyiban, also quality, so your market actually is everyone, not only for Muslim. Okay. I have a, uh, data statistics here. I just came to know that 65% uh, of halal meat from New Zealand, 65% halal meat in New Zealand is exported to non-Muslim countries, 65%. Mm -hmm. And in Malaysia, out of the top 20 uh, countries that imported Malaysian halal products, only two or three are Muslim countries meaning 17 are non-Muslim countries. And the top two are United Kingdom and uh, uh, China. So both are non-Muslim countries. These are the largest importers of Malaysian product. So meaning that the, to socialize, we have to strengthen the quality aspect. Quality aspect means the Taiban aspect in Islam, the cleanliness, the nutritional value, the way we process, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so this is uh, uh, what we we, we should uh, take care of. And then the another question just now. Uh, yeah, uh, some food imported non-specification halal markers. So, what should we? Be our concern when buying imported product to ensure it is halal. Yeah, uh, to me at the moment, what we can do is we rely on the halal certification body. This is the reason why uh, LP POM, MUI, now BPGPH, yeah, Indonesia, JAKIM in Malaysia, and other certification body are, are very important at the moment. Yeah, because we cannot do analysis ourselves. Uh, we we need to get information from the certification body. They are the one who do audit, site audit, and check individual ingredients, etc. So um, of course, if we our background is our background is is uh, food technology or agriculture, we may know a little bit on how to analyze, and then we suspect if there is something uh, uh, non halal, yeah because our knowledge is, 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 is uh, I think we have knowledgeable about something, but still we cannot do in detail. Yeah, you cannot do in detail because the, some of the ingredients, especially pharmaceutical, cosmetic supplement, a lot of additive, a lot of ingredients are added. And then some of that ingredient may not be detected using the uh, normal instrumentation, or we can use only uh, we can detect only if the concentration is high, but editing normally the concentration is very, very low. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Prof. Jaswir. We appreciate your information and answer. And this halal issue is very important for us because the our government, the Indonesian government, uh, has started to implement the Indonesian rule on halal products. Yes, all right. Okay, uh, next to the next uh, speaker, uh, Miss Katie Gets. Yes. Yes, thank Have you for these seen? questions. Yeah. yeah, I can see them here. Okay. Um, um, so the main strategy is to make better food supply chains. Um, that's a really good question. If there was one thing that we all could be doing to make our food systems locally and globally more secure, we would definitely be doing that. So it's um, it's quite complicated, and it's not going to be just um, one type of investment um, that that needs to be made. Um, there's going to need to be multiple um, investments and and sort of things happening at once. Um, but I can say that I think. Um, and this is actually kind of also responding to some of the other questions that are listed here. Um, one thing we're learning from COVID is that um, the opportunity for producer, for exporters in particular, to provide greater value add um, within the countries that they're operating in is really is really important. So um, it's not just 
producing more of a particular product, it's actually starting to harness and figure out wh where within the country you can capture some of those value add opportunities. So um, for something like horticulture, that might mean abiding by new opportunities around sustainability reporting, right? So a lot of investors and other um, global markets, let's say in Europe or in Australia, they're starting to look much more closely at um, sustainability being a marker of, um, of real value and um, sort of preferred um, trade. So that might look like aligning with um, the sustainable development goals for a particular value chain that's, you know, producing something of value and having, you know, clear and transparent reporting around those goals and objectives um, that might look like uh, actually measuring the carbon impact in a particular supply chain and then um, identifying that that's in line with the Paris Accords or something like that. These are just sort of things I'm thinking of um, off the top of my head, but the, that's the way in which um, at least certain sectors in the Australian economy are thinking about bouncing back from COVID is creating higher value products and sustainability is one way that we can use, um, you know, to develop and kind of harness that, that value add. Um, I'm just looking at these other questions. What kind of agricultural products in Australia are badly needed after the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I think I just... Um, sort of answered that. So Australia in particular is going to be, um, well, I should mention Australia, we produce and consume about 80% of our own food. So the amount that we're actually importing in from other countries is relatively small, but the portion that we do Im import in often has higher value, um, you know, that's not necessarily raw materials or raw food items. So it's like, you know, the attraction is some kind of additional thing that that product might have, be it like a sustainability certification or um, something like that. Um, so maybe that's helpful for some producers and exporters. Um, just looking at this last question here, hydroponic vegetables. Yeah, health and safety. So this is a really good point um, from um, the, the last one that's mentioned here. So health and safety has really come out as a key attribute that consumers are asking for both here in Australia, but this is true much more broadly um, that uh, yeah, health and safety are really driving purchasing decisions, both in retail stores, but also um, in international markets. So um, it's a being, it's really actually something that's being used um, in bilateral trade agreements and things that Australia has been working on recently with like the UK health and safety has been a huge aspect of that. Um, let me see here, the increase of popularity of hydroponic vegetables. Yeah, um, just underscoring a big yes that the trend in Australia, as, as was shown in Taiwan, is that the sales for, um, yeah, foods that sort of tap those health and safety um, or tick those health and safety boxes are really becoming more and more important. Um, we're seeing it in beef, we're seeing it in vegetables, and there's a lot of thinking that COVID-19 has, really, um, has really generated a lot of that interest and, and concern. So... I could talk a little bit more about that if that's needed, but I think that might be good for right now. Thank you, Katie. And the next uh, question is for Dr. Tsipumi Takagi. Um, thank you for uh, asking the questions. Um, regarding the first questions, what kind of agricultural product in Taiwan which is badly needed after COVID-19 pandemics I can say uh, onsiju, I'm sorry, my pronunciation is maybe not so good. The cut flower, uh, fresh flower, um, this is 90% exported to Japan. However, after the COVID-19, Taiwan crossed the border and uh, the number of the uh, airplane uh, goes to Japan, it's drastically decreased. So that's why the sales of the onsiju, uh, it's drastically decreased. 
so I can say uh, one of the agriculture products, uh, but for um, negatively impacted on the uh, COVID-19 um, in Taiwan uh, was on siju or uh, the cut flowers. Um, and uh, the question from uh, Dr. Saidima, um, in a place here in Kundari, uh, COVID-19 pandemic has led to increased demand and uh, hence sales for blah, 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 blah. Yes, um, actually uh, the Taiwanese um, middle income and high income uh, consumers, they are pretty happy to be able to order uh, a vegetable box. And uh, that products are uh, hydroponics and uh, organic. Um, anyway, uh, that is a safe product uh, compared to the um, conventional products, maybe in general. And, uh, but uh, the product of the um, vegetable box, uh, that is they ordered uh, one box um, and uh, different kinds of uh, vegetables are uh, delivered uh, maybe once a uh, two weeks, uh, once a week, or maybe once a uh, uh, three days or four days. Uh, it depends on the options. But this, uh, this is a pretty new business model in Taiwan. So that's why uh, still um, many people are kind of um, confusing if they receive uh, the vegetable box, but uh, they, some, some, some of the vegetables, they are not familiar uh, to cook um, and how to eat. So um, the farmers or the online shop uh, sellers they needed to prepare for certain uh, level of the recipes, how to cook the new vegetables. So um, this is kind of, I can see the new like tendency, uh, what happened uh, after the COVID um, among the uh, high and middle income uh, consumers uh, in Taiwan. Okay, thank you, Chikumi. Uh, is there any other question from the audience okay i think it's enough for us today and we are very thanks to all of you of the honorable invited speakers but before we ended this session we would like to present certificate of appreciation uh, for your time in this conference uh, please help uh, the committee. Uh, the first invited speaker is uh, Professor Irwan Lee Jaswir. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this uh, we are very appreciate your uh, time. Thank you. And the second certificate is for Katie Ricketts as invited speaker. And the third one is for Sipumi Takagi. So we appreciate your uh, session, your time in this conference. Thank you very okay, much. thank you very much. Okay. okay we are moving to the next agenda uh, to the committee please thank you thank you to professor ansarula excellency distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen coming up is parallel session we would like to inform you that parallel session will be divided into two parallels, which each parallel has five rooms. For, par for the participants, we kindly inform you to move to your breakout room provided after the break at one o'clock. And before having lunch, I ask you to all participants to turn your video or camera for photo session. Selanjutnya adalah sesi paralel. Kami ingin menginformasikan bahwa sesi paralel akan dibagi menjadi dua, yang mana setiap paralel terdiri atas lima ruangan. 
Dan bagi peserta yang mengikuti sesi paralel, dapat langsung bergabung ke room yang telah disediakan setelah lunch break pada pukul 1 waktu Indonesia Tengah. Dan sebelum itu, kami meminta kepada seluruh partisipan untuk mengaktifkan kamera untuk sesi foto bersama. For all participants, we inform you to change your username with template your room, your room name underscore your name. Dan sebelum itu, kami mengingatkan kembali kepada para peserta untuk mengganti username-nya dengan template nama ruangan underscore nama Anda. Again, to all participants, please change your username with template your room name and your username. Complete name will be better. While having the lunch break, we would present to you the video of Lulo Mepo Koaso Dance. Please enjoy the video. Selanjutnya, persembahan video tarian Lulo Mepo Koaso. Tarian Lulo Mepo Koaso adalah tari tradisional suku Tolaki yang biasanya dijadikan tari sambutan sebagai cara untuk menunjukkan keramah-tamahan dan persatuan dari komunitas masyarakat Sulawesi Tenggara. Lulo Mopo Kuaso Dance is a traditional dance of suku Tolaki that symbolizes the hospitality and the unity of Southeast Sulawesi community. 